Welcome everybody to the Symposium Psychoanalysis and Revolution in Ireland. A major inspiration for this event is Ian Parker's and David Pavon Cuyar's 2001 Manifesto, Psychoanalysis and Revolution, Critical Psychology for Liberation Movements, in which the authors propose a set of ideas about the revolutionary aspects of psychoanalysis and how they can be applied to understanding the relationship between the personal and political dimensions of our lives. The psychoanalysis they propose, however, is not a promise of total freedom, but instead illuminates the obstructions to freedom. In this way, when we consider a concept such as liberation, psychoanalysis can be useful in understanding the nature of power and indeed what the subject is to be liberated from. More specifically, their manifesto is helpful in addressing these concepts in an Irish context. To which end we have gathered a number of experts in the field and can look forward to some fascinating presentations this evening. The manifesto has already been translated into many languages and published in many different countries. Against this backdrop, this symposium is also an opportunity to celebrate the progress we are making in raising the fee to have it rendered into the native tongue of Ireland, Guelga, a language that has suffered greatly from the industrial capitalism and colonialism, and with which, moreover, many Irish could be said to have an ambivalent relationship. But there have also been many significant Gaelic revivals throughout the years, and indeed we might be entering another one now if we consider the recent surge in mainstream songs and recent films in Irish, and the Guel schools that are um, being set up all around the country. A dual question we, we want, might reflect upon here concerns what was lost with the decimation of Guelga, and whether we can fully decolonize to use Franz Fanon's word, while, we, while still speaking the language of the oppressor. And moreover, what the Irishing of this manifesto might fruitfully achieve. Modern Ireland may be considered a relatively wealthy and stable country, but it could be argued that we are still haunted by the traumatic elements of our violent and bloody history of colonialism, emigration, an abusive theocracy, and a callous capitalism steering the economy. In their manifesto, Ian and David use psychoanalysis to provide an analysis of the subject of capitalism. Lacan discussed the capitalist discourse in the early 70s when he introduced the fifth discourse, and his comments provide an important insight about the social bond under capitalism. Neoliberalism refers to the political economy that underlies the functioning of capitalist societies and can be broadly characterized as a socio-economic system that installs false needs people are driven to satisfy, though they work and consume in excess and yet continue to experience dissatisfaction. This state can be the cause, the cause of a great deal of mental distress for the way it leaves people in a constant state of disappointment in regard to never getting what they think they need while plaguing the subject, the, the subject with surplus jouissance. Despite the economical optics, parts of the population in Ireland are suffering from the same neoliberal politics that are perpetuating enormously high levels of mental health problems around the world. In Ireland, however, the numbers are actually higher compared to other European countries, with over 20% of the Irish population recorded as having a mental health issue, such as anxiety, bipolar, uh, depression, and alcohol and drug addiction. There have been a dramatic increase in the numbers of people receiving psychiatric diagnosis and prescriptions for psychological medication in a way that could be said to mirror the American culture of dependency on psychopharmaceuticals. It is also grimly fitting that some of these multinational corporations in Ireland are pharmaceutical companies, including American companies that are clear beneficiaries of these escalations. It is not only these multinationals that get significant corporation tax breaks in Ireland, but big tech and data centers do too. However, despite these multinationals apparently bringing incredible wealth and jobs to Ireland, which is a common discourse that the politicians would roll out, none of this trickles down to the most marginalized and oppressed. Although the government experienced a 5 billion surplus in the exchequer returns 
Ireland still has the highest rate of homelessness and sadly the highest rate of child homelessness it ever had. In neoliberal econ economic systems such as Ireland, the most vulnerable become the real surplus in our society, both stuck in the system and forever cut off and relegated to the outside of the real of representation. Yet we seem paralyzed as a nation to revolt against such horrendous state of affairs. Why is this? In many ways, not only the Irish, but much of the global population know how state governments and corporations collude and synchronize their surveillance technology to control citizens. But the existence of the unconscious delimits our awareness of how ideology affects us and keeps us partially blinded. If the unconscious allows ideology to work as well as it does, as Ian David and David claim, this operates on a number of levels as the unconscious is made up of, and I quote, history, economy, society, culture, and ideology. With the increased use of technology, rather than inhabiting what uh, Frederick Jemison called late stage capitalism, it feels like the, it's an era of techno capitalism is only beginning where ideologies are spun at an accelerated rate throughout the social, me social media networks, while smartphone technologies proliferate consumerism that exasperates direct connections to clinical depression for many users, whereby people report feeling disconnected from others in the world around them. The paradox is that, the, that most of us collude with this alienating activity. But Mark Fisher's concept of capitalist realism highlights how capitalist modes of thinking have pervaded both imaginary and the symbolic spheres and convinced subjects there's no alternative to buying into these values propagated by neoliberal capitalism. The critical psychology in the manifesto's title points to how the dominant field of clinical psychology is complicit and synchronized with the neoliberal system in which the process of psychologization traps people inside identity categories that create binary oppositions in which as individually constructed objects, they are competitively pitted against each other in the pursuit of power. In this context, the authors speak about the apparatus of patriarchal power in particular as transmitted through discourses that reaffirm rigid binaries, but also reproduce inequality, oppression, toxic masculinity, and can fuel political imperial powers that can erupt violently to the extent of escalating threats of nuclear war. And a brief example that we can reflect on with regard to the significance of the translation to Gwelga is that if we consider the English word husband, it signifies patriarchal privilege, yet the Gaelic term farkela literally means together man, as it speaks more of partnership based on equality and each otherness. In the manifesto, upon reflection of these rigid marginalizing binaries, David and Ian consider racial equality, feminism, and broader lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and associated struggles as indispensable allies to psychoanalysis in the service of liberation movements. The, author, the authors maintain that it is only when psychoanalysis is purified of its own inherent, inherent prejudices, dogmas, stereotypes, and illusions, a can be a very effectual tool to not only beginning analyzing the subject of capitalism under neoliberalism, but also a revolutionary theory that contributes to sustained socio-political transformation. Against this fertile political backdrop, this symposium is a perfectly timed opportunity to enhance our understanding of the Irish context in a psychoanalytically orientated space that focuses on the subject's relationship to its language and history, in which questions around where we come from, who we are, and where we are going can be stirringly raised. With such debates in mind, I am delighted to introduce our first speaker of the evening, Fergus Campbell who will deliver a paper entitled The History of Psychoanalysis in Ireland. Fergus is a lecturer at Newcastle University in the UK and author of earlier books on 19th and 20th century Irish history, Land and Revolution, uh, in a history of the revolution of the Irish Revolution, 1916 to 23, uh, but is now working on a history of psychoanalysis in Ireland. Um, so I'm actually I know for a fact, uh, Fergus, there's a lot of people really interested and looking forward to that book, and in particular, a lot of psychoanalysts. So we're, we're very glad to have you here, Michael. Uh, sorry, uh, Fergus. But thank you very much, Nigel. Um, um, I'm going to have to screen share in a sec, so hopefully that should be OK. Um, but I thought I'd just say, um, you know, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And 
you know, I'm interested in psychoanalysis, but I'm also interested very much in the Irish Revolution. And I'm also learning Irish at the moment as well. So, you know, I think what's happening, I, I, I really, you know, feel um, I'm very excited about this book, about Ian and David's book. So I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to try and stand up because it's it's so bizarre, like giving a talk in your in your office at home. But if I kind of stand up, it feels a bit more like I'm somehow doing a presentation. So can I, if I start screen sharing now, Nigel, is that will that be okay? And can you hear? Me, can you hear me? Okay, I can absolutely, uh, Fergus. And I've just made you host, so I think oh, you can you can fantastic. take the share screen. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, so. so. Right. So can Nigel, Nigel, can you see, can you see that slide? You can. Fantastic. Okay. So I know we've only got 15 minutes, so I'm going to try and kind of whip through this a little bit. There's quite a few, quite a lot to kind of get through as it were. So I'm, I'm going to try and talk about the formation of psychoanalysis in what I suppose the Irish Free State, 1928, coming up to the present. Um, and I guess what we could say is that, um, that there are sort of two two sort of views of the formation of analysis in Ireland. One is that the sort of founding moment, if you like, is um, Jonathan Hanahan, this Englishman um, arriving in Ireland in 1928 permanently um, and beginning to practice as an analyst. So that's that's one hypothesis that the, the, the formation of analysis in Ireland begins with Hanahan's arrival in 1928. And then there's, a, I suppose, another view, which is that the, the critical point is um, when Cormac Gallagher um, returned from Paris in 1974 with Lacan and began working in private practice, actually at Gonzaga as a Lacanian analyst, um, and then gradually began to um, establish um, reading groups and finally uh, a master's in um, psychoanalysis at UCD in 1984. So, so the, I'm gonna look at the two careers of Hanahan and Gallagher and kind of reflect on their kind of contributions to the Irish kind of case. Um, so Hanahan first, here we see him in, the, in about 1960, I think this photograph, he's obviously in the middle of the older man and surrounded by Dennis Duncan, the Cameron brothers, Rupert Strong, Gordon Fletcher, Wilfred Boyle, uh, Jan Imick, uh, um, uh, a man who had survived the Holocaust in Poland, uh, and Mary Miles as well, who was uh, from Southampton. Um, so Hanahan himself um, was born in Birkenhead in 1887. Um, and I think probably unusually for European analysts at that time, uh, was from a working class background. His dad was a sort of rank and file soldier who the family think probably had some sort of PTSD um, following his sort of military experiences. Um, Hanahan left school at 14, had sort of working class jobs, uh, organ tuner, postman. He had a bit of education in in a Quaker school in Birmingham and also a, a folk, folk school in Denmark. Then discovered Freud walking down Lord Street in Liverpool, I think in about 1915, got very interested in psychoanalysis, started reading analysis, um, and eventually um, wrote to Ernest Jones in May 1922, um, saying that he wants to join the British Society, uh, at which point Jones says to him, you know, you could be analysed by Douglas Bryan, uh, who's, who's in London at, at that time, Brian, who's just come back from Vienna, having been analysed by Freud. John, Jonathan, always known as John T, is analysed by Brian in London between 1925 and 1927. Um, and according to Hanahan, Jones sort of sends him to, to, to Ireland uh, in an interview from 66. Hanahan says, Hanahan recalls, um, Ernest John said to me, I read your letter, I'll be frank with you, I'm a Gale and you're a Gale. When I read your letter, I thought this was a chap who's generally been in this thing. 
um will you take a training it would be lovely if you could go to ireland so there's that in hanahan's mind anyway in his, his his sort of experience uh jones is sending him to ireland i think the reality might be a bit more complicated than that but we haven't really got time to dig into that at the moment but that's certainly hanahan's um sort of uh the way that he's kind of interpreted that that experience so so ha hanahan comes to dublin in 28 with his four daughters and his second wife mary webb who's from dublin or, or certainly was dublin based um in the early 20th century um he starts practicing privately from his house in monkstown and belgrave terrace um probably we could say just given the working hours that he had that he probably analyzed about 200 people between 28, 20, 28, 67. He sets up a, a group that meets every Saturday night at his house where he gives lectures on psychoanalysis. The lectures are, there's about 300 of the lectures in the National Library, if you feel like going and having a read of them. Um, he, he's giving public lectures as well in Dublin hotels. He's writing lots of letters to the Irish Times. He's, he's, he sets up a theatre company, which has plays on at the Peacock fairly regularly in the 20s and 30s. He sets up a publishing house the Ruiner Press, which is publishing uh, lots of poetry and so on. He he trains, he goes on to train uh, three other English analysts who, who he's encountered in the Liverpool area before. He comes to Dublin and they move, they migrate to Dublin. He trains them and he sets up the Irish Psychomatic Association in 1942, including Rupert Strong, Wilfred Boel, um, himself and Gordon Fletcher, who were the initial kind of core group. So, so he, the, the group starts to meet on a Saturday night. Um, he's giving these lectures. Everyone's invited. Um, and I suppose in that sense, we're talking about this idea of psychoanalysis and revolution. Um, the, Hanahan is very, we could say, very sort of pro socially progressive. Um, if we look at this picture, this photograph, it's very blurred. It's, it's a photograph from Mount Town House, which was the, the commune of this up in the 1950s, um, which we haven't really got time to talk about. But if we look at this, we can see Jewish immigrants. Um, we can see Nigerian immigrants, Talano Asuni, Fatai Dabiri, um, um, Harry Taylor, I think was from um, a, a Jewish immigrant from Eastern Europe. Um, so it, it, it's a very, this photograph from sort of circa 1949 50, probably one of the most interesting, one of the most diverse rooms that, you know, in Dublin at that time. So there's a, a very strong anti racist dimension to Hanahan. Everyone is welcome, everyone is treated kind of equally. Also, you know, he's, he's offering analysis. If people can't afford analysis, that's fine. They can pay, you know, when they do start to earn after the analysis. People are paying for analysis with vegetables, with, I, I don't know, people are paying in all sorts of different ways. Analysis is, is being, there's a view that analysis should be provided if people need it, whether they can afford it or not. There's people who've been involved in the Irish Revolution that are showing up um, for analysis, a guy called Jack Maxwell, whose family had um, had a sort of traumatic experience um, in, County Offaly in 1921. There are former members of the IRA uh, who are speaking at the group. Um, there are quite a lot of members of the Dublin Jewish community there. Uh, Jan Imick, who, uh, as I said earlier, was a, a Jew from a Jewish man from uh, Warsaw who'd survived the Holocaust as a child, ended up in London, wanted an analysis in London but couldn't afford it, and then literally moved to Dublin because it was much cheaper to get analysis in Dublin, actually came to Dublin to get analysed. Um, and also people who were survivors of industrial schools were uh, getting analysis or, or coming to the to the group as well in Dublin. So this is the kind of work that Hannah and the group were doing. Um, we could say, just as, you know, jump, jump, because there isn't very much time, we could say that, you know, Hannah achieved a lot in the sense that maybe you know several hundred people probably got analysis from the group between the 20s and the 80s um but there was a sense particularly in the 50s and 60s that Hanhan's group became overly kind of um 
uh, idealizing of him and they weren't really reading anything else. They weren't reading other psychoanalytic theories. Um, and a younger group got a bit disillusioned with this and set up a new organization called the Irish Forum for Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy in 1986. And that became very important. But um, we haven't really got time to talk about them, but they are very important as well. We could say there were problems with the group as well, particularly in terms of boundaries, um, people talking about other probably analysts I, th I get the impression analysts talking about um their patients problems to other people there is at least one example of a sexual relationship between one of the analysts and the patient um, um there wasn't much supervision um you know we could say that in some ways there were um there wasn't much there wasn't much theoretical diversity or keeping up with theory um on the other hand we could say that lots of people would have had an encounter with analysis through the group and the various initiatives that they were involved in. Um, and, you know, the, there's no doubt that lots of Irish people would have first heard of psychoanalysis through, through the initiatives of this group um, in various ways. So if we look at the, 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 the next important figure, we'd say is Cormac Gallagher, um, who, as I said to you earlier, brought, brings Lacan to... Dublin in 74. Gallagher is born into a, unlike Hanahan's a sort of, you know, English Quaker. Um, Gallagher is a, a, an Irish Catholic born in 1938. In the mid 50s, uh, decides to join the Jesuits, goes to UCD to do a degree in maths and physics, um, which I don't think he really enjoys. Um, decides to go and do uh, a master's in psychology at Fordham in the late 60s, uh, and he's planning to do a PhD in psychology at Fordham, but through a kind of accident, he winds up in Birmingham meeting uh, a Scottish Jesuit called Jim Christie, um, who was on his way to Paris to get involved in a course organized by a French organization called AMAR, um, um, Association Medico Psychologique Dead or Religio. Um, and while, so, so it's an accident, this is an accident really that Cormac uh, meets Jim Christie, who's on his way to Paris. He goes with Jim Christie, goes to Paris, meets Louis Bernard, um, and gets involved in or finds out about the Kenyan analysis. Um, and Bernard suggests that he begins an analysis, which he does then with Christian Simatos. Um, as Cormac said, that he had analysis with Simatos for the guts of 40 years. Um, and and Cormac becomes immersed in Lacanianism in Paris in the early 70s through this kind of accidental meeting with Jim Christie in Birmingham in 69. So he's he's in Paris, he's going to the uh, he's in analysis. Um, he's going to Lacan's uh, public lectures. He's also going to some of Lacan's um, uh, presentations at um, St. Anne's Hospital. Um, and there's this one famous moment where Cormac meets Lac Lacan. Um, as he said to me last April, it was the last big outing of the Lacanian school in, in Paris. Uh, it was at the chemical school. It was one weekend and there were about how many I suppose a thousand people. Um, um, I can't actually read my slide because um, I've, because of the faces on, on the right hand side. But um, someone says to Cormac, go over and say hello to Lacan. Um, and Cormac goes over and says, excuse me, I've come from Dublin. Uh, vous suivre to follow your seminar. And Lacan looked at me and said, vous suivre. And that was me. And then as Cormac said last year, this would be vintage Lacan. It didn't matter what he meant. It was just the word, whatever resonated. Um, and obviously it resonated with me since I remember it after all this time. What did you take from that? I took from that that I'd better be a bit more independent in my thinking from him. I think that that's what he meant. It's an intervention and you make of it what you can. So this was obviously a very important encounter for Cormac meeting Lacan in the early seventies. He then comes back to Dublin, uh, in 74, he's working as a clinical psychologist at St. Vincent's. He sets up as an analyst, actually, in a room at Gonzaga. He's translating the seminars. He sets up a reading group at Gonzaga. He sets up a reading group also at, at St. Vincent's. It's important to bear in mind also that he's working with Noel Walsh, who's the 
psychiatrist at St. Vincent's at that time, who's uh, also just had an analysis in Canada. And he's a one of those kind of psychiatrists who's very interested in psychoanalysis and that sort of hybrid um, psych psych a, a psych psychologically informed psychiatry. Um, so the, the sort of double act, if you like, or, or uh, of, of Cormac with Noel Walsh, um, then set up the, the MSc in psychoanalytic psychotherapy at UCD in 84. Um, and by the early 90s, there's about probably 50 graduates of that course. Um, and at that point, Cormac then sets up something called the Association for Psy Psychotherapy and Psychoanalysis. Sorry, I've, I've actually got written that wrong in my slide. It's the Association for Psychoanalysis and Psychotherapy in Ireland. Is that that's what I understand anyway? Someone may correct me if that's incorrect if I've got that wrong. Um, so Cormac sets that up with with colleagues in the early nineties as a, a sort of um, learning society, uh, and then gradually that expands to having about two hundred members by. 2007. Um, there is unfortunately a split in the in API in early 2007, um, and um, sorry, um, oh, I'm just trying to figure out how I can move you, move your faces so I can actually read the slide. Um, Maybe minimize or um, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Can you still you can still hear and see me? We can indeed. Fantastic. Um, so, um, so, so we then we have this split in 2007, um, which leads to the formation of a number of new Lacanian groups. Um, and um, we could we could say that following the split in 2007, um, a new organisation called the Irish Society for Lacanian Psychoanalysis is set up which some of the sort of founding members of API get involved in. Another organisation has established the Irish Circle of the Kenyan Orientation is set up, which is part of the Jack Alan Millerian group. And, you know, arguably that's to do with his translation of Lacan and also to do with the Millerian International Organisation, which ICLO is part of. API continues after the the, the divisions in 2007, uh, and also sets up a new organization called, called the Freud Lacan Institute, which is kind of engaging with Irish society in a wider way. And there's also the Milltown Lacanian Association as well. Um, I suppose the, one of the questions might be, um, um, why has this happened? Why have there been this splits within Dublin Lacanians, it's something that I'm trying to um, write about at the moment, trying to research now. Um, and I suppose one of the issues that, that comes up is whether it's possible to promote psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic psychotherapy in the same organisation, whether that, that they are different practices uh, and is there something contradictory about them coexisting within one organisation? That maybe is one question. There were also debates about the letter, which was up his journal, that generated conflict in 2007, should the letter be um, theoretical and, and primarily theoret theoretical and clinical, or should there be some more applied um, psychoanalysis, should contributors be predominantly Irish or international? Um, so these, the divisions within Irish Lacanians from 2007 are something that I'm researching now and trying to understand. Um, I can't really say any more about that. Uh, now, um, I suppose one of the finally one of the interesting questions is why is it that Lacan is, is so influential in Ireland in a way that it, for example, is much less. It, it, there is a presence in Britain, but it's a sort of more of a minority within, you could say, British psychoanalysis. And it often occurs to me that it might have something to do with the Irish language um, decline of the language in post famine Ireland uh, and the, that sense of as you've mentioned already, Nigel, that, that many Irish people are to, to say, alienated from their own language and from the language of their ancestors. And I suppose Lacan's idea that the, the unconscious is structured like a language, where there's some sort of resonance 
between Lacan and Ireland in that sense of wanting to get access to this lost language, to this lost uh, or this hidden unconscious. Um, and there might be something about that that's made Lacan so um, important in Irish society and Irish culture. Uh, and I suppose also something to do about the relationship between uh, Lacan and Catholicism as well. So if we try to conclude, then we could say that, um, you know, that Hanahan did establish a kind of Freudian analysis in Dublin in 1928, and maybe as many as a thousand people had some kind of encounter with analysis or the group um, during that period. On the other hand, we could say that Cormac Gallagher established the first sort of formal training for of psychoanalysis in, in, in Ireland um, in 1984, uh, and also practiced, a, you could say, a rigorous, theoretically informed clinical practice, which maybe we couldn't say that so much about the Hanahan group. On the other hand, we could say that many people had a first experience with the Monkstown group and then went on to the Lacanian training or analysis. So there's a sort of overlap between the groups, even if, if Gala himself um, had never heard of Hanahan before he um, went to Paris. So, so Gala's first encounter with analysis is with Lacan. Um, we could say that both of them are very important as founders of analysis in Ireland and founders of psychoanalytic psychotherapy uh, in Dublin and, and have influenced the several hundred practitioners in Dublin and outside Dublin in the Republic of Ireland at the moment. It's also important to bear in mind there are these other currents that I haven't really had time to talk about leading from the, um, the Irish um, Forum for Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy um, towards the MSC that has been set up at Trinity um, with a more British independent and sort of Kleinian orientation. And it, it just crossed my mind when I was putting these slides together today that Roisin O'Boyle, who is part of that group or certainly part of the MSC at Trinity, told me recently that she is actually conducting um, analysis and psychotherapy in Irish at the moment as well, which might be relevant to what we're talking about. I've, hopefully raise some interesting questions there and it would be great to have some discussion um, and I hope it will, it made sense. Thank you very much Fergus uh, and it certainly didn't make sense Um, you've covered quite a lot in a very short space of time and you definitely are leaving us all uh, with a lot of desire to read your book um, when it's finished. Um, I suppose I just wanted to, I just, uh, if anyone wanted to kind of come in or make a comment or ask a question, um, but I, I do love that uh, when Lacan, uh, when, when Cormac said to Lacan, I follow you or following you from Ireland or whatever I, the, the French was, I just think it's fascinating of what he said um, and, and how Cormac interpreted that as I need to, to think more independently. So that's yeah. just a, a fascinating, yeah. that struck me. Yeah. Um, just wanted to you know, open it up to uh, to anyone, or if um, or I think there's a hand, Tom. Yeah, I I I just um, I'm just taking from um, thank you for both your contributions, and, and uh, I wonder whether there's some idea going on here that that um, the Irish language is not permeated by neoliberalism. Mm. Mm. So you're right. So that kind of, uh, uh, you, you go for it, Fergus. Well, no, just I think that's a very interesting idea. Yeah, that's. I mean, I suppose what coming from my point of view is a uh, you know, I've got Irish parents, but I grew up in England. Um, I'm learning Irish. I, you know, there's there's word you know there's words in Irish that you, that can't be translated. You know, and you know, so I suppose there is that. I, I, I think the the trauma of the loss of the language is hard to exaggerate, mm. um, and yeah, I, d I don't know. I think yeah, my idea coming back with this is that some idea permeating here that that and it's the difference between being a Gael and being a, a, an Irish person, you know. So you've got a Celt, a Gael, an Irish person. So it's almost like in a way, there's then diagrams going on here that you you know that. Primary here with regard to speaking the Irish language, that you're a Gael first and an Irish person second, and something about like that in the DNA that of the you know the Celt or the Gael, it's altogether different than the, the the DNA of the the of the you know the broader Irish context here. So 
I, I'm just is just floating an idea here that it, it's it's not um you know that the Irish language has not been permeated with all this terrible stuff about neoliberalism as we we're discussing just earlier on. Uh, some idea very, in, in mind here. You know? It's very interesting as well, isn't it? That a lot of comics key statements have been made in Irish. Yeah. Um. You know, and that's obviously been very important to him. And, and when he was a teenager, they tried to. He was so good at Irish that the he was off. He was told that he should become professor of Irish at UCC. That that could be a route for him. You know, so the Irish language was obviously very important to him. Um, and, and he does make these key statements of scale go, you know, yeah. often as well. Hmm. Well, thanks, thanks for your, your comment, Tom. Is someone else coming in there? Can I? Yeah. I just wanted to say when I was doing my paper, I was also thinking that question you were asking about psychoanalysis in Ireland and the interest there is in it. And I think it is. There is that idea of the, you know, the unconscious and the the message that we have that we're not aware of. So I think it is an interesting, like there's an interesting comparison there. And it does, I think it does give rise to a question about the interest in psychoanalysis, Lacanian psychoanalysis in particular, in this country, I think. Do you do you think there because I know a lot of the Lacanians that I know uh, wish that there was more interest in psychoanalysis in Ireland I mean do you think there is a do you think there is a, a strong interest well I don't know I mean I don't I don't know I just I suppose it's more because they're both interests I have but I, I do I do wonder about how it has taken off and there is obviously a bit of a parallel there between a language being repressed and then the language and, and listening to words that are repressed I mean there is an obvious kind of parallel there and I think it is an interesting question I mean <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, I think there's to, to keep them questions floating. And I just wanted to say thanks very much, Fergus. It was fascinating and you've definitely stirred uh, more questions. So and I think I, I, it makes more sense to uh, join our next speaker who might be able to answer some of them questions, but also uh, evoke more as well. Thanks, so I just wanted to introduce our next speaker. It's uh, Michael Cronin. Uh, Michael is 1776 Professor of French in Trinity College Dublin and Senior Researcher in the Trinity Centre for Literacy, uh, Literary and Cultural Translation. Among his uh, recently published titles are Eco-Translation, Translation and Ecology in the Age of the Anthropocene, Irish and Ecology, on Gwelga August on Eireoliacht, and Eco-Travel, Journey in the Age of the Anthropocene. He is a member of the Royal Irish Academy and former Irish language literature advisor to the Arts Council of Ireland and former chairperson of Poetry Ireland. So you're very welcome and thanks very much, Michael. Michael's paper is called The Empty Mouth Language and Trauma in Modern Ireland. That's great. Thanks, me, Nigel. And um, Nigel, I wonder if you could make me co-host um, so that I can uh, just share some of the, the slides here. Certainly. That's great, thanks. You should be in there now. Super, yeah. Okay, and uh, um, right, can everybody see those um, slides? Yeah, great. Um, okay, well, the first thing is just to, to thank uh, Nigel for the very kind invitation to take part um, in uh, tonight's session about um, questions are very, very uh, close to, uh, to my heart. Um, and it's, it's nice to be back in DCU, even if only virtually, um, because I taught there for more than 20 years. Um, so we have very, very formative years uh, in terms of my own uh, development. Um, and I suppose um, what I particularly welcome tonight is the opportunity to look at this question of the relationship uh, between uh, language and culture and the question of, of trauma in Ireland uh, in the context um, of Ian and David's uh, work on, on psychoanalysis and, and, and revolution. So at, at, at various points, I want, I want to suggest why that particular context that they provide in their work uh, is uh, important uh, to me. Um, so um, one of the passages um, in the work that, that that's uh, very much kind of resonated with me um, was um, relatively early on in the book um, when they're talking about this notion of the unconscious. And they say our everyday words and actions also involve past history, even the, remote, even the most remote, even that of past centuries, history bears us 
All of this is present at every moment, limiting us and guiding us in a certain direction, but generally in a way that is not fully conscious to us. This limit and possibility is the unconscious. Um, and sort of echoing some of what um, Fergus was saying um, in, in his uh, talk and uh, point was kind of picked up by, by, by Paula, I, I, I want to kind of explore how I think, uh, if you like, um, variations uh, or versions uh, of the unconscious um, inform particular representations or particular ways of thinking uh, about the, uh, the Irish language, uh, and in particular, uh, all kinds of things that are unspoken or unsaid uh, about the language uh, in, in various uh, uh, public and, and, and private uh, arenas. Um, I wanted to begin uh, with this uh, book by Hilary Mantel, uh, probably better known for her work on, on uh, Thomas Cromwell uh, and the, the Tudors, but it's a book that she published in 1998 about the giant uh, O'Brien. Um, so the giant uh, O'Brien uh, was uh, Charles O'Brien uh, from Mid-Ulster, a man who was over uh, eight foot uh, tall um, and who after his death uh, was on public display uh, up until two months ago in the Hunterian uh, Museum in Glasgow for more than 250 years against his express uh, final uh, wishes. Um, one of the things that Mantel discovered as she was writing this book um, was the nature of, of her own uh, Irish uh, ancestry. And she got particularly interested uh, in the relationship or in the way in which uh, Charles uh, O'Brien, who was a native uh, Irish speaker, uh, gradually evolves to becoming uh, an English uh, speaker in English society. Uh, of the, the time. And she was interviewed sort of after the book was, was completed. Um, and she, uh, in her, um, one of her statements, she said, um, I felt a great sadness about the loss for me uh, of the Irish language. Uh, I was aware my mouth was uh, empty. Um, so two things there. One is this kind of sense of transgenerational trauma. Um, which he's sort of experiencing uh, through uh, working uh, on this uh, man, Charles uh, O'Brien. And secondly, it's the way in which he expresses the particular image that she uses to describe this sense of emptiness. Um, and she's referring to the mouth, so she's invoking orality. Um, but what she's invoking are two things, if you like. Uh, one, the empty mouth, uh, which is a sign of, of hunger. Uh, and then there's the empty mouth, uh, which is the, the mouth where particular words have been taken uh, away uh, from it. And this um, resonated, if you like, with um, work that I've come across by the uh, Franco-Armenian uh, analyst, <coughs> Janine uh, Altunia, uh, in her book, De la Cure à l'Écriture, where she basically looks at people uh, who were uh, descendants uh, of the survivors of the Armenian genocide in um, 1915. Uh, and one of the things that she kind of explores in a book, so what she does is she uh, translates the account, the first-hand account by her grandfather uh, of the uh, Armenian uh, genocide. She translates this into, into French. So she's partly looking at this whole question of what happens with transgenerational and translinguistic a transmission, uh, where, if you like, um, after two or uh, three generations, uh, the descendants no longer speak the language, uh, which was the language that was where you, you experience the initial site of the atrocity, the initial kind of traumatic event, uh, and what kinds of you know, translational mechanisms are, are going on then when you're trying to retrieve from that other language uh, the traumatic effect uh, of that uh, initial uh, event. Uh, and the, the word, or the, uh, when she's describing this particular, the, the research that she's carrying out, she says, there is a close connection between dying of hunger and lacking the words to speak about yourself, think about yourself, identify oneself, and explain the world uh, in your own uh, language. Um, so basically, uh, what she's suggesting then is that this kind of um, that orality, uh, speaking, and hunger, um, which are these kind of uh, sort of coterminous 
uh, sites uh, of intense uh, trauma means that the, the fact of speaking, the fact of no longer being able to speak uh, a particular language uh, becomes um, a profoundly kind of ontological issue because you're very, uh, the possibility of you continuing on as a human being is imperiled by, by the absence of food. So the absence of food and the absence uh, of, of words uh, begin to converge uh, in this kind of uh, traumatic uh, effect uh, or a traumatic event, which then has kind of transgenerational uh, consequences in uh, particular ways. Now, what's interesting, if you think about this notion of food, and you think about the notion of words, uh, and we look at what happens um, in post-famine uh, Ireland, uh, and this is where, if you like, this particular kind of convergence becomes uh, gendered, is uh, one of the most common um, people uh, in upper middle class households uh, in the US uh, throughout the, um, the 1860s, the 1870s and the 1880s uh, was the person who was referred to uh, in derogatory terms as uh, the Bridget uh, or the, the Biddy. Mm -hmm. um, so these were uh, usually uh, young single uh, Irish women. Uh, we know that one of the distinctions between Irish immigration patterns and those in other countries is an extraordinarily large number of single women who uh, emigrated from Ireland uh, in comparison to uh, other nations or, or places. Um, and the two things um, that the kind of the anti-migrant discourse, uh, if you like, emphasize uh, with respect to these migrants is food and language. Um, Food in the, um, as reported in uh, Hannes um, Nassian uh, Diner's book, um, her 2001 book, uh, Hungering for America, where she compares uh, Italian, Jewish, and uh, Irish food cultures uh, in the US. Uh, and she says at one point, the Irish in general were thought to be inordinately stupid in all matters. But women's ignorance about food received vast commentary. Right? The two things, um, if you like, that you find in statement after statement after statement um, was uh, that these women were completely uh, indifferent to food and the preparation of food, they had no consideration for it. Uh, and secondly, um, that their language was this broken down thing. Um, that half the time it was impossible to make out what they were saying. And when you could make out what it was saying, uh, the words and the syntax uh, were kind of all over the place. Uh, they were incomprehensible. Uh, they sounded quixotic, uh, odd, parodic, and, and so on. So here you have these uh, um, migrants um, who are uh, speaking basically a kind of translated uh, version of, of Irish in many respects. Irish is very kind of strongly uh, ghosting uh, their, their language. Uh, but again, it's the idea um, that, 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 that food and language uh, converge in this point uh, of, of crisis. And so, for example, one uh, member uh, of the uh, a letter writer to the um, the Boston Transcript in 1874 uh, remarks on the fact for several years Irish incapables have reigned in our kitchen and general discomfort has pervaded uh, the, the house. Um, sorry, Michael. So, uh, yeah. Sorry, I just wondered, could you let uh, Ian in? Ian's uh, line broke. Um, and I'm just wondering, your host now, I just wondered, do you see him uh, uh, looking to get through? Okay. Uh, sorry, to, sorry to disturb your flow. No problem. Yeah, it's going to be, yes. Okay, is it okay? Yeah. Um, thanks, thanks. Uh, no, so, so, um, so the, uh, the writer uh, of this letter is uh, probably better known as the author of Little Women, uh, Louisa May uh, Alcott. Um, so, and in the course of the letter, um, she also talks uh, about the uh, the language, the kind of deficient language uh, of these uh, young uh, migrant uh, women. So, just 
keeping in mind or so bearing in mind this sense of uh, troubled uh, orality, right? this, this kind of uh, the convergence uh, of, uh, vulnerability, of vulnerability and trauma uh, around uh, orality. Uh, and then um, if we uh, move to um, what the historian uh, Garrett Othoic uh, calls um, the most uh, fundamental social and cultural change in modern uh, Irish uh, history uh, was the shift from Irish to English as a vernacular of the population at large. Right? So we see the evidence uh, of this uh, trauma. Uh, we know from one of the most distinguished historians uh, of the 19th century um, that this is the single most important uh, event in terms of of particular kinds of change uh, in the uh, in the society, uh, and then if we uh, move to a um, documentary which is produced in 2020 uh, to commemorate the 175th uh, anniversary uh, of uh, the Great uh, Irish uh, Famine, um, which uh, was broadcast in two parts. Uh, it ran for 102 minutes, that's almost uh, two hours. Um, 40 seconds in that two hour documentary were devoted to the Irish language. 40 seconds uh, in, a, uh, in two programs that last uh, 102 minutes. 40 seconds uh, to describe what one of the specialists of the period will describe as the single most momentous uh, event in uh, Irish uh, history. Um, if we look at the uh, work of Barry McRae, who has um, looked at this question uh, of uh, minority language uh, and trauma in, in, in different minority language settings across uh, Europe. He talks about the experience uh, of his family in, uh, in Mayo, so his, his, his grandparents. And he says, having lived all their lives in the same place, spoken the same language, spoken the language of his place named in history, having spoken indeed a micro dialect, the language unique to the town and itself, and connected intimately and inseparably from its landscape and memories, they found themselves foreigners at home, surrounded on all sides by an alien language, unable, unable to speak to their own, uh, to their young neighbours. This is a relatively common experience for migrant, for immigrant uh, families, but even a stranger one for people who had never left the place uh, they were from. Um, in other words, um, there are two things uh, to bear in mind in terms of language shift in Ireland. Uh, the first is in historical terms, how extraordinarily recent it is. Uh, and then within the language shift itself, um, how dramatically telescoped it was, um, how uh, a, uh, in linguistic terms, historical terms, um, how abrupt and traumatic and sudden uh, that shift uh, was, because uh, although there were, uh, if you like, developments going on prior to the, uh, the, the, the famine, um, the famine itself was a spectacular force of acceleration uh, and one that affected primarily uh, the Irish speaking uh, members of the uh, population. Uh, so we have an island that at the beginning of the 19th century is predominantly Irish speaking. And by the end of the 19th century, we have about 2.7% of the population that are uh, speaking or uh, using uh, Irish. One of the points that's made repeatedly by uh, Ina David in their work um, is just how central uh, the notion of speaking uh, or language is to the practice of psychoanalysis itself. In fact, it's one of the things that distinguishes us from uh, other forms uh, of practice um, such as uh, psychiatry uh, or various kinds uh, of uh, other forms of psychological uh, intervention. Um, and they uh, say that Psychoanalyst, what defines, if you like, the analyst is to listen to the speaking subject, providing a strange, 
confidential space for the analysant to speak of their distress and to hear connections made between past and present in their own speech, connections that they had never uh, heard before. Uh, and a little later they say, as we will see, unlike the symptoms of medicine, psychoanalytic symptoms are not simply visible signs, they're more like words that demand to be listened to, that speak. These symptoms speak of distress and resistance, uh, they open up uh, the possibilities uh, of, of change. Uh, and of course, we think about this then, um, if psychoanalytic practice is to be defined uh, by that sense of linguistic communication uh, and exchange, when linguistic communication and, uh, and exchange itself is uh, profoundly affected by particular kinds uh, of, of events, uh, then engagement uh, with the psychoanalytic process itself or with psychoanalysis uh, more generally. If we look at, at, you know, I mean, this has been outlined to us by, 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 by Fergus, um, that the, the, the very late development in many ways uh, of psychoanalytic practice uh, in Ireland, uh, the lack of institutional uh, supports for it, um, the kind of the active hostility at institutional level to what it was uh, about, could at the one level uh, be attributed to kind of church intervention, the, the, the desire of the church to have a kind of monopoly uh, on the speaking uh, subject, to kind of coerce the speaking subject into its own kind of uh, interpretive or hermeneutic uh, grids. Uh, but it could be seen at another level uh, as a kind of um, deep uh, distress, deep unease, uh, about uh, what the uh, speaking subject would do uh, in a situation of, of language fracture, of language displacement, of language uh, shift. What uh, the Irish poet Noel Nihon uh, once uh, said to me when I interviewed him many years ago, uh, which he described as the scar tissue uh, in the, 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 the Irish psyche uh, around this kind of the question of, of, of language. Um, and of course, uh, this. Uh, trauma gets picked up in uh, interesting ways. Um, one of the earliest people to really give voice to this uh, was a man called Sean Lefteña, who in 1960 uh, wrote a book called um, on, called Sirsha Gonsol, which means like uneasy uh, freedom. This was translated into English in 1965 as the Great Silence. And basically he was taking a phrase that was used by the uh, folk song, the, the folklorist and artist George Petrie described the Irish countryside after the famine in 1851. He talked about the great silence, the disappearance uh, of the population, all the voices, the songs, etc., had disappeared uh, from the landscape. So um, Defenia uses this phrase to describe the extraordinary silence uh, around the question uh, of, of, of language shift um, and a kind of this, this, this kind of the, the, uh, the, the dual trauma uh, of uh, death uh, through famine, disease and, and migration uh, and the, the, the shifting from uh, one language uh, to uh, another. Uh, and this uh, recently as uh, 2020 in a book that basically describes a kind of running uh, journey uh, through County Longford uh, by uh, John uh, Connell. Um, he refers to, um, on page 59, uh, when he's talking about the Great Family, he won't even call it uh, using the, uh, the English term, this is an English language book, he uses the Irish word, uh, the Great uh, Hunger. Of course, what's interesting about the Great Hunger, Moor, as opposed to the Famine, um, is that uh, what Gartha hunger suggests is there's food there, but you can't get to it. Um, there was enough food to feed 18 million people in Ireland uh, between 1845 and 1848. So it wasn't the absence of food uh, that led people uh, to die and emigrate. It was getting access uh, to that, uh, that food. But he, a little further on in his um, book, says, uh, we are the half shadow to the ghost people. Um, so this is somebody writing in English, describing his uh, running trails through County Longford uh, in 2020, 175 years after the famine, and still there is a sense in which in that untranslatable term, that untranslated uh, term, uh, there is a kind of transgenerational trauma that is coming uh, from that uh, language shift, language displacement, which of course is fundamentally 
uh, bound up with the colonial and socioeconomic structures uh, of the society at the, uh, the time. What I want to um, argue is that this um, sundering between uh, people uh, and, and, and language uh, and place has profound psychosocial consequences uh, that we are still uh, living through, um, which um, relate in part to a very important, the very important kind of development uh, of the idea of psychoanalytic uh, ecosocialism uh, in David and Ian's work. And this is basically what I, I would argue is the kind of the tension in Ireland between a culture of possession and a culture of, of, of dwelling. Um, one of the consequences, or one of the immediate consequences of language shift is that the language that Irish people had and had for uh, more than 2000 years to describe every single facet and feature and detail of their landscape, every field, every tree, every plant, every field, every insect, uh, and the human and more than human relationship, uh, all uh, of these uh, were removed. Right? Uh, so suddenly uh, people found themselves in uh, an environmental as well as a linguistic sense, uh, deeply uh, un unhoused. And it seems to me um, that this has had um, very profound and ongoing uh, consequences uh, for us. Uh, in order to illustrate this, I want to uh, refer briefly to the work um, of um, a much lamented uh, member of the English department in uh, the University of Galway, Pat Sheeran, um, who um, had a wonderful article um, back in the 1980s where he, um, he talked about this notion of, of an Irish sense uh, of, of place. And he says, um, it is well nigh a truism that Irishness and a sense of place go together. So closely do connect identity with location, that when we tell others who we are, we tell them where we come from. Uh, and this is what, you know, I sometimes refer to as the GPS, the kind of the Gaelic positioning system, that every time you meet somebody here, one of the first things that people do is they ask where you're from, they say, I think that accent is, you know, from Dublin, from Cork, from Kerry, whatever. Uh, and then if you're in Cork and you're Corkonian, you say, well, I think that's an East Cork accent, a West Cork accent, would your mother be related to the, you know. So it's this kind of intense, what we see as our intense commitment to uh, and love of an interest uh, in, in, in place. It often seems one of the things that, is, that defines us. Um, but what Sheeran says in this um, article is that when you uh, look at things more closely, he says, what is uh, immediately striking about the Irish preoccupation with, with place is that a little nothing to do with tending, cultivating, enhancing or otherwise, or otherwise materially affecting uh, the immediate uh, environment. Um, and of course, uh, when we look at our catastrophic uh, environmental uh, record, uh, if we look at what has happened to large swathes uh, of the Irish countryside, uh, if we look at um, what is currently happening uh, to the uh, the city uh, of Dublin, uh, what we find is this uh, extraordinary uh, disregard uh, for uh, place. Um, in uh, 2018, the Natural History Museum in London um, looked at 240 nations uh, in terms of what was called uh, a biodiversity intactness uh, index, 240 nations. Um, Ireland came 13th from the bottom, the Republic of Ireland. Uh, the country that was in 12th place from the bottom was Northern Ireland. Um, so the cumulative environmental record of uh, the island of Ireland uh, in protecting that place that we allegedly cherish uh, so much uh, was uh, nothing short of, of, of disastrous. Um, and so what I would argue is that what we have in, in Ireland um, is this extraordinary culture of possession as opposed to a culture of dwelling. Right? Uh, a culture of possession, you can see this in the, in the, the kind of boom bust nature of the property market, uh, the intense preoccupation uh, with property uh, and the possession of property during the land wars, which in many ways 
perfectly understandable because of the uh, dispossession during uh, the colonial uh, period. Um, but the other thing um, that this culture of possession points to, I think, is uh, once you get completely sundered from a knowing dwelling, a knowing inhabitation uh, of, of a place, what you're left with then is a kind of uh, abstracted possession uh, of, of place as opposed to a knowing uh, dwelling in it. So what you develop then in your relationship to place uh, is a highly instrumentalist or extractivist relationship uh, to place. And what's interesting is that the kind of instrumentalist disparagement of the Irish language, you can't sell a pig uh, in the Irish language. Um, it's, it's not commercially uh, uh, useful. Uh, there's no return on it. It's precisely the kind of extractivist instrumentalist language that has, has created so much environmental destruction in, in yeah. Ireland, where you simply extract net value uh, from the landscape uh, without due care or attention uh, to its uh, integrity. And um, just one um, final uh, point, because I, I realize I have sort of um, seriously overstepped the boundaries of, of time here, is um, I think the relationship between language and violence. I've talked about language and hunger, language and, and dispossession, um, but is to, if one looks at the, um, the nature of uh, colonial um, violence um, in, uh, in, in Ireland, um, what strikes one is the sense in which this, um, that the, the, the period when we begin to get the shift in, in language uh, from Irish to English, um, was the moment uh, of extreme um, violence. Um, uh, Patricia Palmer, I, I thought I had her uh, titles up here in the slide, but they don't appear to be there. Um, she talks about um, in the late 16th century and the early 17th century um, that the, uh, the use of extreme violence, a third of the population uh, will, will die during this uh, period, mainly through violent uh, deaths. Uh, and, and, and famine, um, that this, the, the beginning of this, 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 this language uh, shift um, is accompanied by extreme physical uh, coercion. Uh, the one example I give you here is a general rehearsal of wars by a man called Thomas Churchyard, um, who was praising um, the Tudor campaign in Ireland, and he talks about what in the Munster campaign, says that the heads of all of those, whatever sort they were, which were killed in the day, should be cut off from their bodies and brought to the place where he encamped at night. So he's referring to this colonel. And should there be laid on the ground by each side of the way leading into his own tent. So that none should come into his tent for any cause, but commonly he must pass through a lane of heads, which he used at terrorum, the dead feeling nothing that more pains thereby. And yet it did bring great terror to the people when they saw the heads of their dead fathers, brothers, children, kinsfolk and friends lie on the ground before their faces as they came to speak with said colonel. So the colonel in question uh, was a man called Sir Humphrey Gilbert, who was described in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, the most recent edition, 2004, as a man of considerable intellectual uh, sophistication. Um, he was a graduate uh, of Eton and uh, Oxford. Um, so um, the fact that there is um, such considerable violence um, around um, language shift, it seems to me, has um, uh, a number of perverse uh, consequences um, in the, uh, the post-colonial uh, period. Um, and these are cluster around symptoms of anger, uh, guilt, uh, fear and, and ridicule. Uh, anger, insofar as one of the things I've, I've noticed in, in debates and conversations about the Irish language uh, over the years, is um, how it generates extraordinarily strong emotions, uh, often extremely negative or, or, or hostile ones, uh, which are completely out of proportion to what would have been the original trigger, somebody making a comment about an Irish language school or newspaper or something. Um, and so, so this in itself kind of, you know, um, where the symptom becomes a kind of almost a sort of a metonym for much larger 
arenas of, of violence. Secondly, the use of violence in the, in the classroom, uh, in the colonial period uh, to uh, force uh, the English language uh, on, on children. Um, and then in the post-colonial period, the use of violence in the Irish language classroom uh, to teach the Irish language uh, to children. So you're getting this kind of specular uh, effect in terms of, of the relationship uh, between uh, language and, and, and violence, where in the post-colonial period, uh, it, it, it plays out in different ways, but still re remains uh, with that within the, the unconscious kind of economy of, of violence uh, itself. And I think I'm going to leave the, the other points because I realize I got seriously uh, over uh, time here. Um, so thank you very much uh, for uh, bearing, bearing with me. I'll, I'll stop to share here. Well, uh, thank you very much, Michael. Um, I think I can speak for everyone. We're, I'm glad you uh, went beyond the boundaries of time. Um, excuse the, the the poem, but you've given us a lot to chew on there. Um, and I think it would be um, a perfect opportunity for anyone to to uh, make a comment or um, reflect on, on on everything you said there. Um, it's just a it's a, a, a fascinating presentation. Um, well, it just, it's just a, a small little comment, but it was just, I suppose, the, the oral drive was so prominent in the first part, you know, um, just bringing it back, I suppose, to that Freudian kind of thing, but like the, the eating and the speaking, it, it, there is such a connection there. Um, I just thought it was worth saying. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's interesting. I think if, if you look at in terms of um, one of the things that comes out of, of, of Diner's book, and she's, she's looking at sort of Italian and, and Jewish and, and Irish uh, food ways, is that how in terms of emergent identities, um, that food becomes absolutely central uh, to the construction uh, of Italian food identities in, 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 in the US and even more called broadly in kind of global terms. Um, whereas, uh, and this would occur to some extent um, in terms of, of, of Jewish culture in the US, um, but that in, in Irish uh, culture, food becomes you know, completely absent. It's, 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 it's this, this, this thing that literally is unspoken. <laughs> um, and it's the kind of the unspokenness of food it, it, you know, it, it is kind of paralleling the, the, the unspokenness of, 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 of language shift itself, you know, and, 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 and what's, what's, what's happening. Um, so that this, you know, this orality comes up in, in all kinds of, 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 of different ways. Um, thank you, uh, Paul, and thanks for the, the response, Michael. Uh, Anthony, would you like to say, come in there? You know, I feel, thank you for that presentation, Michael. I suppose I, I, I thought there was a, a kind of an irony there that you spoke so eloquently and analyzed things so uh, with such exactitude in English. Um, and I was wondering, the trauma that we've referenced several times here, uh, it, I could understand it in the sense of, of the generation that it happened to, to. But what do you feel is the mechanism, if there is one, um, by which it is or becomes transgenerational. Why? 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 Why would we still feel it? I think that the where I, I see the transgenerational trauma, um, it's and it's that 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 slide there when I was looking at at questions of um, uh, around you know anger, fear, uh, guilt, and 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 so on, is that I find that when you know, Irish comes up. So, for example, you know, I've lived my life in in in, in both languages, I, um, in both Irish and English, both languages, both languages at home. Um, but what I've noticed is that, um, and this has been the repeated experience from childhood uh, upwards, is that um, when I'm in a group uh, where they're both English speakers and, and Irish speakers, is and when Irish comes up, either because use some Irish uh, or the, the topic of the language comes up um, there's absolutely no neutrality about it um, people are either um, there's a kind of um, uh, 
sort of gushing sentimental uh, celebration of Irish, which, which always strikes me as <laughs> radical forms of overcompensation. Um, uh, or I get the kind of uh, the ridicule, um, the kind of the, the, the you know, the, 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 the Gregor and the, the kind of the, you know, and or I get ev evocations of peg, uh, or I get these <laughs> people's descriptions uh, of their awful schooling, um, uh, or you know, uh, somebody tells me how bad the provos are. You know, I mean, so uh, so it, it, in other words, it's it's where I think the trauma is still very uh, present um, is that there are so few neutral spaces. I mean, and insofar as there, there can never be such a thing as a neutral space, you know, because every, everything is, you know, there's always ideological configurations at any particular moment. Um, but I, I, I see that as, as something that I, I and, the, and it's the very fact that it is, it remains unspoken, that it, it is not, you know, you have this extraordinary, I mean, I just gave that one, one tiny example of that to our uh, famine documentary, but I could give you countless more examples uh, of, of the silencing uh, of, of, of this, this, this fact. Um, so I, I think where you really f f find it is, 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 the, is the kind of the emotional uh, afterlife of, of this in, in, in you know, Michel Certo's, Certo calls the kind of the, the interstices of the everyday. You know, that's, that's where it strikes me most. Yeah, no, thank you. And thank you, um, uh, Anthony. And I just, yeah, I, what's evoking for me is just that, yeah, a complete uh, disconnect uh, with the world around us. And it's easy then to uh, pilfer the nature around us. We don't fully have a language for it. We don't fully understand it. Um, definitely loads uh, uh, evoked me in the sense of th there was a lot of resistance in the classroom as well and a lot of aggression. You, know? <laughs> you could feel a lot of aggression in the teaching and in the experience of, of being a pupil uh, myself. Um, but I'm also happy at a personal level because <laughs> my daughter is going to the Grail Talk to, uh, next week. And I think that experiencing and speaking language amongst nature um that's really where it needs to be learned isn't it like with like, others in nature while they're doing things as opposed to the top just, down just one one other uh, just thought on this uh night and since it's just um you know partly pick up on anthony's question there is that i think one of the things that i i think we really need to to to, to explore and there was just the very end there i had a there was a slide on the, the collection of essays that came out in the 1980s by three Italian psychoanalysts, and it was called the, the Babel of the Unconscious, uh, where basically they, they argued that in the formation of psychoanalysis, um, if, if you look, that they, they, they operated very much the kind of multi, multilingual world, um, that, that the Ferengi and Freud and all that, they, they, they were, they, they, that, um, that different languages, multilingualism and, and, and and translation was a very important part of their the, 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 the world. But so what they claim is that, you know, um, the, the notion of translation itself is, is always already there uh, in, in, in the formation of psychoanalysis. But it, it, where I think it, it bears in the, the current situation in Ireland is that there's, this, there's a kind of a notion, I think, in Ireland um, that uh, the perfect translation is possible. That you kind of um, you can you can fully translate yourself from an Irish language world to an English language world, and um, you know, and once you smooth out the kind of the rough bits, you know, uh, the kind of the funny accent and the odd syntax and the strange words, uh, you you can then sort of you know, you, you can make this full uh, translation uh, into. Uh, and the, so the country itself becomes a kind of a, a, like a perfect translation uh, of, of itself. Uh, but of course, one thing that you find, um, you know, I spent most of my professional life doing this kind of, you know, studying translation and the history of it and, and, and so on, how it's played out in different uh, arenas, is um, that it is an extraordinarily, by, by definition, imperfect uh, uh, process um, and that you always, always uh, get, you know, what Derrida calls the remainder, you know, the, the remain, uh, and the remainders become a reminder, you know, and this is, I think, why the remainders as reminders 
trigger uh, the kind of uh, emotions that I described uh, earlier. So I think there's something in that, and since we're talking about translation of the, the Irish translation of this text this evening, there's something it seems to me that, that's very important uh, in there, uh, the need to, as Brian Field began to do in that famous 81 play, begin to interrogate this notion of what it means to be a translated people. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, and I think um, I think I've I've uh, organised the presentations perfectly because uh, next uh, we have uh, Paula Gallagher. Uh, I suppose Paula has been a you've been there from the start, Paula, and been the great support of this project, and uh, kind of been the resident Guelgor, uh, if you want to put it that. Um, so Paula is a graduate uh, of both the MA in Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy, as well as the Higher Diploma in Psychoanalysis from Dublin Business School. She has also completed a Diploma in Irish from UCD, University College Dublin. She works in private practice in Dublin with adults and adolescents, as well as in a residential setting with people with brain injuries. Paula is a member of ICP, API and ISLIP. And Paula's paper today is Psychoanalysis and the Irish Language. So thank you, Paula. Take it away. Thanks, Nigel. OK, OK. Um, psychoanalysis and the Irish Language. This is a very big topic, so I will try in the time allocated to address a few key aspects and address a few questions around the effects of the decline of the Irish language and how we as Irish people relate to language. What can we say about our mother tongue and how the Lacanian concept of La Longue can add to our understanding of this? Also, I will reference a few political and literary figures and how they situated themselves around language. I will open by referencing the late Charles Melmont's paper on psychosis, Schreber's Lack of Lack, 2009, which he presented on a visit to Dublin. He addresses the effects of the rapid decline and removal of the Irish language. He describes that the Irish language was the name of the father. The function of the paternal metaphor is to allow the subject to take up a subjective position relating to their desire. In the absence of this function, the subject is prevented from taking up a subjective position and will have a distorted perception of reality when the missing signifiers of the paternal metaphor are encountered. Without this name of the father, the Irish could not operate in the field of reality that the symbolic permits. Melmon highlights that without the name of the father, men lose what it is to be a man by being emasculated and women lose their femininity by it not being acknowledged through language. Melmon, 2009. Melmon here getting to the core of subjectivity that language enables, allowing men and women to take up positions relating to their desire and with this placing them in relation to the other. Melmon highlights the Freudian quality of the unconscious that it does not allow psychical freedom. And because the unconscious is the discourse of the other, we are not masters in our own homes. This discourse that Lacan established to be structured like a language is the driving force behind our life choices. The signifier represents the subject for another signifier. Meaning and knowledge do not have the fixed properties that they can be perceived to have, as it is the signifiers that speak. Freud described the unconscious to be the text that we are unaware of, yet whose message our life is organized around. Melmont, 2009. Melmont here bringing to our attention that there is always an alienation in language. What therefore are the consequences of a further alienation? Cormac Gallagher's inaugural paper that launched the letter, Tír Gan Tonga, Tír Gan Anam, an Irish Jew, 1994, a country without a language is a country without a soul, an Irish Jew, in which he examines how language is essential in the subject's subjectivity, taking up a position of desire and subsequently how the death of the Irish language should not be overlooked by analysts in this country. He explained that he chose to address his paper to a European audience as he believed it would not have been well received by a purely Irish one due to the ambivalence that is commonplace in this country regarding the Irish language. Gallagher finishes his paper asking for further questions on this loss. In any case, the death of the Irish language is something that needs to be on the agenda of analysts working in Ireland, and that this can scarcely affect to produce fruitful questions for language and psychoanalysis. Gallagher, 1994. 
Therefore, what are the consequences of a further removal with a foreign language, one that is alien from that of our ancestors and from the language in which they received their message? Is the alienation of language exasperated further when the native language of our ancestors was forbidden and forced into submission and in its place a new language used? I think perhaps to add a bit of context of the Lacanian different and developing understandings around language is insightful in an attempt to break down the effects of a language shift. The early Lacan of the 50s believed that language causes trauma due to the nature in how the subject incorporates language, due to the fundamental loss that precipitates it, and how it is the signifiers of speech that are repressed and can come pathogenic. Whereas the late Lacan of the late 60s and 70s understanding of language developed in accordance with his work on the register of the real. That the body is overwritten with signifiers from a pre-symbolic time, this reel of language and of the body is traumatic as it is without law. This reel of the body comes to be regulated by the subject's acceptance of the paternal metaphor. The primary signifiers are otherwise referred to as master signifiers created from this primordial desire before language come to be marked on the body. The castrated subjects chain of signifiers represented by the S2, that which are repressed, are connected to a primary signifier, the S1. The primary signifier S1 is primordially repressed, yet orientates the subject and situates the subject in relation to the other signifiers of their signifier chain. Lacan describes that the signifier must be defined as what represents the subject for another signifier, Lacan 1970, meaning by this that the chain of signifiers S2 is needed to retroactively interpret the primary signifier S1. Therefore, when considering the relationship between the primary signifiers and chain of signifiers, there will be a traumatic effect when a language shift is experienced and one that will have an impact on the generations that follow. An attempt to gauge how the generations born during or in the aftermath of the Irish famine in the midst of degradation, combined with transition of language, would have incorporated language gives rise to many questions. How could they have taken up a subjective position as a desiring subject, alienated from their native tongue, in the tongue of the other, shrouded in an atmosphere of ambiguity and ambivalence? Was there a transmission of signifiers between the generations, signifiers that encapsulated the family histories and myths? Were there generations with primary signifiers, those marked on their bodies, in the tongue of their ancestors, and therefore further removed from what would become their English chain of signifiers? A question of mother tongue. What is meant by someone's mother tongue? It tends to be the language in which the subject has the most fluency. However, it is possible to have more fluency in a tongue that is not your mother tongue. The mother tongue is the tongue in which the mother spoke. It contains the remnants of the memories of she who introduced the subject to the utterings of speech. Malmon explains that the mother tongue is in fact the tongue in which the mother was prohibited. It is therefore a tongue of negation. This tongue of maternal associations is also the tongue that will launch the subjectivity of the subject. Then, consequently, the tongue in which the subject will continually search for the object cause of their desire. The mother tongue, as the tongue with the primal association for a desire for the mother, will therefore be the tongue in which slips betray this desire. Malmon posits that another learned language will not have this betrayal, as it is a language free from such primal disturbances. In such a case, all that remains is the music of the accent of the memory of the mother's tongue with the memories of the prim primal desire to live one's life in a different language from the mother tongue can in fact enable the subject to hide in a liberating world from the signifiers of their primordial desire this melmon describes can have a quality of mania as speech is effortless and flowing with no inhibitions or else he posits can result in the subject exhibiting different neurotic traits while inhabiting a new learned language away from their mother tongue. In the case study of Anna O, the inaugural patient of psychoanalysis, her mother tongue played a role in her neurosis. In the chronic phase of her hysteria, she was no longer able to speak German, which was her mother tongue, and only spoke in English, which Freud noted as excellent. 
She was still able to understand German. However, on the death of her father, her comprehension of German too, for a time, disappeared. This illustrates that Anna's relationship to her mother tongue was directly connected to her unconscious repressed desires causing her illness as it manifested as a symptom. Freud, 1893. So what can be said around our mother tongue? Lacan's changing beliefs on how language constitutes the subject developed from the role of the paternal metaphor in creating subjectivity towards a growing emphasis on a pre-Oedipal jouissance of language. This pre-Oedipal jouissance he termed la langue, the word for tongue and language. Lacan describes la langue as the mother la langue. La langue is a libidinal enjoyment from the real of the body that stems from a time prior to language and then continues alongside the signifiers of language. This primitive body of la langue, originating from the libidinal drives, creates and repeats sounds with the mouth and tongue that will culminate in the speech of the subject. La langue is a primitive language, originating from the language of the other, that which mediates the relationship between the, mother, the baby and mother. The sound and rhythm of these baby utterings will in time develop into the tone inflections and nuances that are particular to the subject's speech. The traces of this bodily drive are left on the signifiers of speech. What Lacan would come to believe is that this la langue, which constitutes speech, has a knowledge and understanding of the subject that far exceeds anything the speaking being will ever be able to articulate. Lacan 72. La langue consists of that which cannot be quite specified, as it is between the phonem and the word. In fact, all that constitutes the thought of the subject, and it is what is and what will come to be the primary signifier, the S1. Yes this primitive constitutive language created from a primordial desire is the foundation of unconscious knowledge. Essentially, too, La Langue demonstrates that the signifier has elements of jouissance that are not derived from meaning in the first place. A language shift would therefore have an inconceivable effect on the subject due how the baby's speech is constructed from the speech of the mother and passed down from generations. Also, when the primal filled jouissance of La Langue is considered, that it is, in, is incorporated into speech and operates alongside it as a nonsense and real component of language that will resist the symbolic. Can this not have, can this not but have consequences when a shift in languages like that which was experienced in this country occurs? As the people of the country were in a way alienated from the libidinal component of their speech. Yeats, 1865 to 1939, played a pivotal role in the Irish cultural revival. Yeats, whose mother tongue was English and who wrote only in English, wrote the following in the national newspaper, The Leader, in the year 1900. The mass of people in this country cease to understand any poetry when they cease to understand Irish. What Yeats is capturing is the idea that although English was his mother tongue and that of most of the country at this point, Irish was the mother tongue of the country as a collective which has resonance when we incorporate the la langue element of language, that the speech of the subject originates from libidinal enjoyment and is incorporated from the other. Even though Yeats wrote in English, he did so with the tone, sounds and musicality that he took, according to Yeats, from the native Irish language speech of the people. He wrote his English poetry in the metre of traditional Irish verse to create this rhythm, this concept has the Yeatsian quality of the dancer, the physical quality of the words, and the dance, the feeling of the sounds. This is also akin to Luce's analogy of how the lalong of the infant has the rhythm of a dance. The rhythm of lalong that is incorporated into the signifier underpins the singularity of the subject, and that this flow of rhythm in the subject that regulates the real of their speech and body. Luce, 2011. Henri Oliathon, the Irish language writer, commented in his Blackwater River journal, Kishmura, how the Irish people took the King's English and integrated and molded the language onto their own tongue. They turned his language from its sluggish, unyielding English form 
and they molded it to suit their lively minds and their poetic imagination so they could run the two tongues together in a rhythmical dizzy stream that glints with colorful words and sentences. The speech of Irish people today is still littered with Irish English syntactical structures and sounds of the Irish language that have been carried over to the, to the English that is spoken. The picking up of every syllable and the stressing of the vowels are prominent features of this speech. A helping vowel can even be inserted to ensure the pronunciation of every syllable. An example of this is how most Irish people pronounce film as film, and the slender or sound is also brought across from Irish, resulting in the fur being pronounced fur. Um, a fitting reflection on this rhythm and sound and how it affects the subject, I believe that is of Douglas Hyde, Douglas Tejeda, in his relationship to Irish. A contemporary of Yeats, Ireland's first president and founder of the Gaelic League, Conrad Nguelga, he had a particularly strong and interesting relationship to the Irish language. Unlike his well-known contemporaries, his interest in the Irish revival that he presided over was not for political reasons, but from a love and interest in the language. It was the sounds of the language that he loved. Born and raised in the Roscommon Brack Welltocht, he was raised an English speaking member of the Church of England. He would learn Irish from the local land workers and spend time as a boy in their homes, immersed in the Irish language, learn, listening to their stories. He learned it, O Vale Gacluche, from mouth to ear, as an oral language. As a teenager, he experienced bouts of depression. He wrote in his diary and chose Irish as his language of expression writing it as it would be pronounced had it been written in English. So an example of this is Shin Kyaunala, which when you, there's some sort of um, diary extracts that you can see and how he would write something like Shin Kyaunala, which is S-I-N, Kyaun, C-E-A-N-N-L-A, E-I-L-E. -E. He would write it like your shin, your leg. So S-H-I-N, he'd write. And he brought the two words together, Kaunala, with a K. So it was like K-A-N-E-L-L-A. -E -L -L -A. So, I mean, for people who are interested in the, it, it just looks so different. And it's only when you start saying it that you get the, how it's phonetically spelled out. Um, he did not care if he was spelling these words correctly. That was not the purpose. He was a linguist and learned languages from his father. He would go on to attend Trinity, where he would become fluent in French, Latin, German, Greek, and Arabic. However, Irish would always be his preferred language, describing it as the most sensuous attempt to convey music's, music in the words ever made to man. He collected poems from the, from the local people in Roscommon and translated them and made them into songs illustrating how it was the sound that was significant. And he also translated some of Yeats poetry into Irish and again with sort of lyrics and more musical. As mentioned in his youth, it is referenced that he suffered with depression. This is not so documented in his later life. And it does give rise to a question of how languages and in particular the Irish language and his work in reviving it affected him. If it was this purpose and expression and sounds that it allowed that sustained him. His work with the language, perhaps helping him, just as he had helped the language. Hyde's biggest legacy being the revival of the Irish language. Interestingly enough, another point Hyde's grandson made was in his final few years, Hyde forgot his Irish and spoke only English, having alternating between both for much of his life. What was Irish to him and why would ailing health did he lose what had been so significant? He left behind the treasure of Irish, the one thing as commented by his grandson that we have that no other country has. His legacy quite possibly being the reason we have something of the Irish language still existing today. Nuala Nigono, who mentioned, was mentioned already, I think by Michael, um, a contemporary Irish poet who encapsulates the expression that the Irish language enables, 
Born in Lancaster, England, where she spent her first five years immersed in the English language. At the age of five, sent to live in the well-tucked area of Dingle in West Kerry, where she would then be immersed in the Irish language and artist of storytelling. She would go on to study both Irish and English in UCC. Ligonal, who was fluent in five languages, writes prose in both English and Irish, although it soon became clear to her that her poetry could be expressed solely in the Irish language. Ligonal is a writer who has asked herself the question of what language am I in? She has concluded that she is in the Irish language. The expressive quality of the Irish language for Ligonal stems from its elasticity as she believes that the Irish language was not touched by the Victorian puritanical movements, and therefore it was not vulgar to be possible in the Irish language. So she was able to explore more openly sexuality, particularly female sexuality, without the coarse implication of the English language. Although for Nagonal, the expressive qualities of the Irish language is largely due to its innate connection with nature and Irish mythology, and therefore fundamental in her choosing the Irish language, although she herself felt that the Irish language had chosen her, illustrating her unconscious attachment to the language, Nagonal has an interest in psychoanalysis, making reference to it in her poetry using symbolic mythological figures to represent unconscious struggles. The aid of these figures, such as on Woher Grover Grona, the loving and terrible mother, on Banon Lassa, the woman of the fairy force, and on Kailak Bara, the hag goddess of sovereignty, illustrates the conflicting other woman and duality and split that exists in the human subject. The fairy characters are an expression of the ongoing dialogue between the conscious and unconscious, with the aim of challenging the reader to go beyond what is familiar and question the foundations of their existence. Nigonal draws our attention to the split between Irish and English and the split between the conscious and unconscious. The 50 Minute Mermaid 2007 is a book of poetry written in Irish by Nigonal and translated into English by Paul Muldoon. The mermaid is the symbol for the lost indigenous language of the land trying to cope with a new world created by an alien language. She uses the mermaid to explain that what is lost can't be brought into the symbolic order and therefore can become problematic. The mermaid being forced to live on the land and forget about the sea is a metaphor for taking on a new alien language and way of life and relinquishing an old way of living they have adapted to. In her poem, The Mermaid in the Hospital, the mermaid awakes where her fins are removed and in their place instead are two legs. Do shik shi agus ni rao a irval eas gaun ni smo agus jigsalabalehi vi an do rod father for sha. The mythic figure awoke to find her fish tail clean gone, but in the bed with her were two long cold thingmies. With this, Nigonal is describing a mutilation of the mermaid and of the language she represents and removal of what's known and in its place something alien and unfamiliar. In Quivna Onishka, a re recovered memory of water, the mermaid's daughter struggles to deal with experiencing a loss for which she has no vocabulary. Nilain thermi octaki, na thermi targaha, na fokalar be, a torfak on thermi islu da kadeishka. She doesn't have the terminology or any of the points of reference to know what water is. Nigonal here illustrating the missing signifiers that Melmon was referring to. The mermaid's daughter feels the loss of the water, something that has been the basis of the existence of her ancestors, such as the Irish language was. And even though she never experienced this existence, she is, experienced the she is experiencing the loss and is struggling to explain the missing signifiers to her psychiatrist. The 50 minute mermaid is reflective of the 50 minute hour of psychoanalysis. So a recognition or question of the role in analysis around the loss of the language. Jeanette, that's it. Thank you very much, Paula. Uh, again, so much in there and you've given us a really uh, broad uh, look at kind of the development of uh, of Gaelic through some very pivotal characters, and it was great to. I didn't know much about Douglas Hyde, but it was great to hear that was our first president. Mm. 
Um, just um, um, anyone want to maybe just uh, make a comment or two? Um, and it was great to get kind of orientated in the Lacanian. Uh, great to hear kind of uh, Charles Melman as well, who was a, a really pivotal character when he used to come over to Dublin a lot. And there were there were great sessions when uh, he would do a paper and then Cormac would translate his French. And then there would be uh, a real, um, you know, a figuring out of the translation actively in front of an audience. So it was great to hear uh, you quoting Charles Melman. Um, Michael, come on in, Michael. Yeah, um, th thanks, uh, Paula, for a fascinating uh, paper. One thing I was, I was wondering, uh, towards the end of your paper, you talk about the Muruch, about the, um, the, 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 the merfolk that um, that Nihon, um, and do you think that she's attracted to the figure? Hey, at one level, because it's about dislocation, right? So you've got one language, one culture, uh, you know, and then you, you move to another. And um, but is 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 there another the sense in which you know this amphibian creature uh, is is a figure of, of mediation between two 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 radically different worlds? You know that that it's it's both the sense you know that the 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 the, 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 the mermaid or, or merfolk are, are both uh, sites of indicating separation, but also mm -hmm. sites indicating kind of continuity, mediate, they, they kind of mediating. They're almost like, um, you know, I saw this the Irish translated people that the, these the, 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 the mermaids are, are the merfolk are kind of of translators of of of, of a kind, um, and that it's really to do not so much with possibilities of translation as the inexhaustibility you know like they're, they're constantly trying to adapt themselves to this new new world this new place um but it's 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 it's, it's constantly you know proving um mm. prob problematic yeah. um I'm, I'm just wondering is that no i think that's a good i think that's a good way of putting it and i think nigona doesn't she doesn't translate her own work i think she she only lets other people do that so maybe there is, maybe there's two parallels going on there in terms of the the impossibility, perhaps, of merging two things in a way. Um, I think she is also trying to get to the idea, though, of, of some experiencing a loss of something that you perhaps have, have never really had in the first place, which, of course, is all about Lacanian psychoanalysis, searching for that object or searching for what we perceive. But But then there is that extra alienation when 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 we when we reduce these things to signifiers that we don't you know there is that disconnect as well um but yeah i mean it's it's, it's a good observation it's a good i, I think partly because of the thing about you know one of the reasons that you know, translation is an object of such deep suspicion is that the the signifier you know gets unhinged uh, detached from the, the signified mm. uh, and that you begin to move from, from one set of signifiers to, 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 to the other and mm. that sense of, of loss, betrayal, et cetera, mm. um, and it becoming a, a real site of, of distrust, which then turns into self-distrust, you know, like, I mean, I, I think one of the things that I think certainly part of the, the psychic economy of, of Ireland, the colonial and post-colonial period was what you know, German Jewish thinkers called Selbsthass, you know, this self-hatred. I, I think it's a great deal of internalized self-hatred uh, that plays out in the Irish psychic economy. Um, um, and, you know, I, that, that seems to be partly linked to this kind of this <laughs> translation crisis, you know. Um, just, uh, I just thank you for that, Michael. But also thank you, Paula. I think there's loads to to uh, to think about there, and I just uh, even just the, the start of it when you're talking about the, uh, I think it was 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 it Cormac Gallagher Melman about the masculinity and femininity, how yeah, the Melman. Yeah, that's just fascinating. And I think in this culture at the moment where there is a I suppose a transitioning of of uh, understanding of identification for people. And um, that's just a kind of a fascinating uh, the way mm -hmm. it's happening, the way it's uh, rolling out in Ireland, really, and the resistance towards it. 
And I think that, yes, as, as therapists, uh, those who work in the, in the clinic, we're very much aware of this uh, transition of language and how clients are, are really kind of taking, trying to take back control of that. Um, so that's, that's just, can I just kind of briefly just say, because I'm, I'm going to yeah. have to go, go in a second, but I just wanted to say thank you to Michael and Paula. Um, there's so much thought-provoking material in what you've said that it's going to take time to digest. And it seems like an interesting... This question, I think this question about psychoanalysis in Ireland in terms of the language is, it's got, uh, we've got a lot of thinking to do about it, I think. Um, but I just, it, I've really appreciated what you both said. And just wanted to thank you both and also Nigel as well. It's it, It's been a terrific session. Um, I'm sorry that I have to go. No, thanks Fergus as well for, for your paper. Okay, take care everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Um, thanks, Fergus. You'll you'll see the recording. Obviously, we're we're coming up to the to um um the main event really the the authors uh, themselves. So we you we we you, we will I'll send you on the, the video. I will, so thanks, I will watch thanks, it. I will watch it. Thanks again. Thanks, right. thanks very much, yeah. Fergus. Hey, all the best. Yeah. Any thanks, Fergus? Thanks, Ian. Cheers. Um, so yes, yeah, so thank you, Paula, and I'm going to move on. I'm probably conscious that we are kind of close to nine, so um, um, I'm, I'm thank you for your 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 patience and and pushing the boundaries of time as well. Suppose next, I'd like to kind of introduce Ian, and I suppose for many, Ian doesn't need any introduction. But um, I remember um, when I suppose um, during the pandemic, as the virus was spreading across the world, I did hear about this. A manifesto was also spreading around the world in different translations and I did took a chance and I I, I emailed Ian and I said oh would, would you consider having the uh, uh, the manifesto translated into, into Guelga and a very prompt and enthusiastic response was yes so <laughs> then I uh, uh, had to go about uh, uh, translating it so but Ian has been a super supportive to, through this whole process um, and I think actually one of the reasons my ears were uh, perked up about the manifesto because I um, I did hear Ian speak at a, kind of a, I think it was a global global psychology event online uh, very early on in the pandemic and he did this uh, magnificent paper called viral resistance and at the time of this conference the um, riots started happening in in America uh, for uh, the Black Lives Matter so it was actually uh, I suppose in a similar way now, there's kind of riots happening in in, in France at the moment. Um, so I think this is kind of a, a timely to have you come back here and speak, Ian, again. Um, just uh, briefly, I suppose Ian Parker is a co-director of the Discourse Unit and a practicing a psychoanalyst in Manchester. His books include Psychoanalysis Clinic and Context, uh, Sub Subjectivity, History and Autobiography, and along with uh, David, uh, psychoanalysis and revolution critical psychology for liberation movements and probably just to to, to mention as well uh, the Lacanian psychoanalysis revolutions in subjectivity is also uh, a brilliant book that Ian did so without any further ado Ian um, I'll, I'll leave it to you you can take it away okay um, thank you so much Nigel for inviting David and I to be here it's a privilege to listen to the papers and discussion. I'm so glad that the book has provoked this to happen. Um, I'm amazed at the discussion of the diversity of the early psychoanalytic groups, the questions of silence and ecology was really, really fascinating. And the discussion of mother tongue, how important that is. That was uh, terrific papers. Okay, this book, uh, psychoanalysis and Revolution, Critical Psychology for Liberation Movements, is born of translation. I met up with my Mexican comrade, David Pavon Cuellar, in Havana back in 2019, and he told me that there should be an accessible introduction to psychoanalysis for activists on the left. Now, I said that we should write it together, and we agreed that it should not be just another Marxist or Freudian colonization of political struggles and explain something of our struggle with psychoanalysis to those who are puzzled about what the big deal is and wonder why we're interested in all this stuff. 
I should say that we're not evangelists for psychoanalysis or for Marxism for that matter, but we argue that there are some key ideas from psychoanalysis that are liberating, that will help the cause of liberation, of revolution. Well, then the pandemic hit and we all experienced a simultaneous closing of borders and explosion of internet contact, of Zoom and such like. And that meant that David and I wrote the book on email, shuttling the text back and forth between Manchester and Morelia. Our emails to each other are in Spanish, something I struggle with. And the text carries the traces of formulations in English, English and Mexican Spanish. And I suspect in David's French accented Lacanese. We tried our best not to make the book read like a Lacanian book. For those of you who are on the lookout for it, will find some of that jargon there too. And the plan was that it should appear in Spanish and English and if possible, be translated into other languages. But the Russian publisher, who has now had to flee the country, was fast, was first. We're translating all the time in the book, backwards and forwards between theories of liberation, of revolution, and theories of unconscious repetitive processes that drive us. And when they drive us into psychoanalysis to talk to a psychoanalyst, they reappear in transference so we can re-experience them there and reflect on them and do something different with them. So that notion of transference is perhaps the trickiest, the scariest, the one that operates in the clinic in the relationship between those who speak, the analysands, and those they speak to, the analysts. Those are little jargon words, of course, by the way, the psychoanalyst or the analyst for short is the one who often appears to be doing the analysis and the analysand, the patient, an old medical hangover word there, patient, they're the one who actually analyzes as they speak Anyway, back to transference. Stuff from the outside world gets translated into the clinical space. And our task as revolutionaries is, among other things, to ensure that it's not stuck there. So as we talk about four key concepts of psychoanalysis in the book, unconscious, repetition, drive, and transference, we're translating them into common sense to make them accessible, then pulling back from that, worried that turning psychoanalysis into common sense will defang it, will simply turn it into ideology. Pap. And I want the pap. No. I fail again. Fail again better. And here's the thing. A revolution worth its salt should be all about translation. It's not a model that is transposed from one part of the world to another. Good news about communism or feminism that we export and make appear in other languages. It's about what happens when we break out of our own language, our own way of doing things, and make that revolutionary change rebound from other places, allow it to revolutionize ourselves, ourselves at home, at that place that we think is home. And psychoanalysis is all about translation. It's not at all about making us feel at home but is about enabling us to live away from home, in diaspora, in exile, outside of that romanticized place we're tempted to retreat to, the impossible place that was never actually there in the past, but which we might imagine we could return to. So the questioning and self-questioning that psychoanalysis facilitates is something that does not rest, but launches us into a different relationship with who we've been told we are. And it enables us to live with that. It's a relationship with the outside world, the outside world we had to encounter when we grew up, otherness, and the otherness that became part of us as soon as we began to speak. There is a fiction around, an ideological fiction that turns psychoanalysis into a comforting illusion, compatible with all the mainstream pop psychological stuff that's all around us now. The fiction that the psychoanalyst translates what the analysand, 
the patient says and turns it into interpretation that they then feed back to bring about inside in, in interpretation delivered as a kind of colonizing message about what the psychoanalyst knows, knows better. And in its worst forms, the idea is that the psychoanalyst has good ideas and good morals, is a good moral character, been through their own analysis, cleansed, and so not only should the analysand believe what the analyst, analysand, anal, analyst says, but they might try to find a way to cure by being like this good person who's told them how to think. Then that really is close to the kind of colonizing process that the revolutionary psychiatrist Franz Fanon railed against. We think we are sometimes outside language, doing our thinking for ourselves, independent of others before we put our thoughts into words. But we are always, actually always inside language. The question is how we can open up contradictions. So there's freedom of movement and how we can do it in such a way that it is attentive to the way that some people are locked in the language of colonizers, of those with power to define what language is and how a life should be spoken of. There's not only translation between languages, but translation inside a language. So when a psychoanalyst is speaking about the difficulty of working in translation with an analysand from a different language, say, they are actually encountering something of the nature of psychoanalysis as such. It is said that Freud put people on the couch because, as psychoanalysis gained in popularity, so many English-speaking visitors made up his caseload, babbling away in a language he had quite a good knowledge of, but was not completely fluent in. He said he could not bear to be stared at for all those hours in a day, but neither could he bear the exhausting task of responding face to face, showing that he understood what they were saying instead of listening in such a way as to enable translation as part of the psychoanalytic process, a crucial part of the psychoanalytic process. The psychoanalyst should really know better than think they can deliver interpretations from on high, of course, and would know better if they were to take seriously what psychoanalysis tells them about translation. A side note, again and again, when we English people visit the United States of America, we're reminded that we are two countries divided by a common language. I've had this said to me by car hire or rental companies more than once, for example, when I'm trying to work out what this or that rule means. Well, we learn something about translation inside language here. And when we are in psychoanalysis and we are trying, impossible though it is, to obey the fundamental technical rule of psychoanalysis, free association, to speak freely, to say whatever comes into our mind, however irrelevant or stupid, unpleasant it is, we learn something about translation ourselves. So together, but in different ways that cannot be directly translated between the two of us, the psychoanalyst and their analysand, learn something about the nature of language, as well as their own nature as human beings, the beings who speak. Here we make a psychoanalytically informed differentiation between translation conceived of as communication, as if there's some kind of magical transfusion of thoughts by way of words, and translation as transformation. It's intriguing to notice here something crucial in the history of psychoanalysis, how careful Freud himself was to distinguish psychoanalysis from telepathy. If telepathy actually happens, Freud thought, well, who knows what he thought, it's what he actually wrote we're concerned with here, then that would cause all kinds of problems for psychoanalysis. Indeed, what would be the point of psychoanalysis if there was direct communication of thoughts from one mind to another? And since Freud did believe in telepathy, he made sure to prohibit discussion of it in psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis is not the same as telepathy. 
is a completely different kettle of fish, a fishy kettle full of words jumbled up inside our heads and between us. The stuff of psychoanalysis is the language we use to try and communicate with each other and what we encounter in the language as a kind of barrier instead, as we would wish, a kind of conduit. We do not control the meaning of the words we use, and neither can we control what other people understand by them. And although psychoanalysis is often called the talking cure, a description that was given by one of the first patients to describe her own experience of the chimney sweeping she thought she was engaging in as she spoke to her doctor, it's not the putting of things into words that has a curative effect, but the failure to put things into words and what we learn from that about our relation to others and what we learn about our relation to ourselves. So here we are in a space in which there is indeed an illusion of communication, a necessary illusion in which I think I am conveying to you what I want to say and you're understanding it. That space and the space in the clinic is not a level playing field, not an open free space in which the words travel around the ground as on a smooth surface. That space and the clinic in that space are historically structured spaces, structured by historically given forms of power. The power of men who believe they speak less than women, but actually empirically speak more. The power of those in the colonial realms who believe they have the right to be heard, and so on. It's sometimes said that a translator is a traitor, that the process of turning one language into another must necessarily involve a degree of twisting and turning. I'm cool with that. In fact, I welcome that what might appear in another translation of psychoanalysis and revolution might be genuinely revolutionary and genuinely psychoanalytic in the sense that in order to be heard in a different context, to be heard in a different language, something new appears. And what is new then turns back and questions, rebels, tell us something we don't know. We don't speak in conditions of our own choosing. That was a lesson of revolutions and is also a lesson of psychoanalysis. Okay, now then, I have another task, uh, which is this unexpected task, because David has to run back to his university now. <laughs> We've gone on a little bit later than we expected. And so uh, David has just sent me his paper, which I have not read before, and I'm going to read it to you now. <laughs> so wish me luck. And the paper is called Betrayal as Liberation, Marxism, Psychoanalysis and Irish Struggles in Mexican History. Somewhere in our manifesto, we talk about how our ego dominates us, how it betrays us by dominating us, and how we can free ourselves from it through liberation movements. Liberating ourselves is here freeing ourselves from our ego that a appears as our master, who betrays us and through which we betray ourselves. As always with our masters, we must choose between them and us. Either they betray us or we betray them. Either we betray ourselves by submitting to them or we free ourselves from them by betraying them. We must betray our masters to free ourselves from them. One of the reasons why our liberation is so difficult is because it implies a betrayal, a treason to the master and what is of the master within us, precisely in the form of the ego. Betraying and betraying yourself is not easy, no matter how liberating it is. I will give betrayal a positive meaning when the usual thing is that we give it only a negative meaning, such as when we feel that we have been betrayed by someone. I guess this feeling is known to all of us. I felt it, for example, when I was about 20 years old and I read Marx and especially Engels celebrating the United States when it invaded my country, Mexico, in 1846, stealing half of our territory. This first US imperialist intervention 
in, in Latin America was being supported by the reference of our Latin American anti-imperialism. How could someone like me, a young Latin American Marxist, not feel betrayed in his anti-imperialism, betrayed in his desire that he imagined he shared with Marx and Engels? I remember that I accused Marx and Engels of the only thing for which can, one can be guilty for Jacques Lacan. Marx and Engels had been guilty of giving in to their desire, our desire, and thus they would have betrayed us, Latin American Marxists. Lacan observes that there is always some kind of betrayal in giving in to our desire. This was the betrayal I accused Marx and Engels of when I was a young 20-year-old Marxist. I'm sure the Irish Marxists would understand me. It is as if Marx and Engels had supported British colonialism in Ireland. However, as we know, you had better luck than us. Marx and Engels strongly supported Irish independence from the 1850s. Why weren't you betrayed like us by Marx and Engels? I think one of the reasons was the moment in which Marx and Engels spoke about each case. As Peter Scarron has shown, there is a development in the opinions of Marx and Engels on colonialism from the insensitivity to the Mexican case to openly anti-colonial positions in the Irish case. It is almost as if Ireland has taught Marx and Engels their anti-colonialism that will later be so important to our global south. What is certain is that the Irish were ahead of Marx and Engels in the awareness of what was at stake in colonialism. This can be verified in the United States intervention in Mexico in 1846, when hundreds of Irish soldiers deserted the United States Army and enlisted in the St. Patrick's Battalion to defend the Mexicans with whom they identified, just as they associated the American invaders with the English oppressors in Ireland Many Irish lost their lives fighting for Mexico in the St. Patrick's Battalion, which was also included German, Scottish and English soldiers in a spirit that we would describe today as internationalist. Of the few survivors, 50 Irishmen will be hanged by the United States Army. The gallows were their punishment as guilty of treason. Yes, treason, but a treason that has nothing to do with the treason that I imputed to Marx and Engels when I was young. 30 years ago, I felt that Marx and Engels betrayed because they betrayed our desire. On the contrary, the Irish were considered traitors because they had followed their desire, which led them to betray the United States, the United States Army, the United States Army generals, the Irish in Mexico betrayed their masters to follow their desire, not to give into it, not to betray themselves. It was to fight for their desire for freedom that the Irish had to betray their oppressor in 1846. It's not the first time they have done so in Mexico. 25 years earlier, Mexico had gained its independence from Spain in part thanks to the last Spanish Viceroy, Juan O'Donoghue, son of Irish noblemen, Richard O'Donoghue from County Limerick and Alicia O'Ryan from County Kerry, who had to take refuge in Spain to flee from the persecution against the Catholics by Kings George I and George II of Great Britain. Perhaps the legacy of persecution was what made Juan O'Donoghue fight for freedom first against the French invaders in Spain and then against the absolutism of the Spanish crown. This caused him to be imprisoned and tortured twice. Then, as the highest Spanish authority in Mexico, he knew how to listen to 10 years of Mexican struggles against Spain and he signed the Mexican Independence Act just before he died. He was also considered a traitor in Spain. Betrayal against Spain was the only way O'Donoghue could be on the good side of history. This side is always that of desire, but also that of freedom. It is the side of those who want to be free, 
of the oppressed people, whether they are colonized by Spain, the Jews in the Nazi regime, the Palestinians in Israel, or the African immigrants in France or in any other European country. The side of these oppressed people can only be a trench against their oppressions. Defeating the Spanish oppressors required betraying them. The betrayal by O'Donoghue against the Crown of Spain was the same liberating betrayal that another Irishman committed in Mexico, William Lamport, born in Wexford at the beginning of the 17th century, in the bosom of a noble Catholic family, openly hostile to the English occupation of Ireland. First, William, as a student in London, was sentenced to death for writing a text against England, but he managed to flee to Spain. Then he arrived in Mexico and planned to pose as the son of the King of Spain in order to rule the Spanish colony and thus be able to free indigenous black and mestizos. His plan was discovered and he was burned to death at the stake. Like the 50 Irish soldiers hanged in 1847, the Irish nobleman William Lamport was burned to death in Mexico in 1659. Thus he lost his ego for remaining faithful to us. By not betraying us, he betrayed his master, Spain. Lamport's crime was also betraying the oppressor, allying himself with the oppressed, fighting for his desire for freedom. His fault was paradoxically not being guilty of giving in to his desire. It was for not being guilty in the eyes of psychoanalysis that Lamport was guilty in the eyes of power. Lamport's political program is evident in his writings in which he presents himself as a forerunner of our anti-racist, anti-colonial and anti-imperialist struggles. The desire for freedom and equality is eloquently manifested in his poem number 632. There he recalls that Africans were born free like other human beings, that, I quote, it was not lawful to reduce them to cruel servitude, just as it would not be lawful for them to be made captives. And he asks the Spaniards why they buy Ethiopians when they don't want to be bought by them. Defending an equal freedom for all, a freedom in equality, William Lamport addresses the Spaniards, the subjects who identify it with the master and puts them in their place, in the place of subjects. What he does is not simply tell them not to do to others what they don't want done to them. It is not just asking them to put themselves in the place of others either. It is something more radical. It is telling them that their place is that of the others, that of the subjects and not that of the masters. It is as if we told Nazis that their place is that of the Jews or Israeli soldiers that their place is that of the Palestinians they murder, or French policemen, that their place is that of the immigrant they shoot. Our, truth, our true place is always the one of the subject and not that of the master, that of the oppressed and not that of the oppressors. This place of our truth is the one from which Lamport spoke. It was a place that he knew very well, perhaps because he was an Irishman persecuted by the English crown, or perhaps because he was mad. It must be said that Lamport was what we would describe today as a psychotic. He had what we call delusions and hallucinations. Sometimes we must be mad to be in the truth. Sometimes the truth is what drives us mad. We don't know exactly if this was what happened to Lamport. What we do know is that his madness made him speak truthfully with the truth of his desire for equality and freedom by translating and betraying the discourse of the master, the discourse of power and knowledge, the discourse of the monarchy and Catholicism. His fervent religiousness and his aspiration to be king were the theatrical staging in which he could articulate his desire. They were the knowledge that he could subvert by expressing his truth. They were the discourse in which he could speak. They were what was to be translated and could be betrayed by being translated. Lamport's translation and betrayal was carefully scrutinized by the Inquisition. The inquisitors listened to Lamport, 
they heard the truth of his desire, and for that they sentenced him to the stake. Today, his delusions would have been listened to by a psychologist or a psychiatrist who would have sentenced him to psychiatric hospitalization. The truth always has to be silenced. It is something typical of modernity since classical times, especially since the 17th century, as Foucault shows us precisely in that century of La Porte. In the same 17th century, in the scene underlined by Lacan, the Spanish Jesuit Balthazar Gracian tells how the truth terrifies and makes us escape from it. We can't stand the truth, and now we persecute it with psychology or psychiatry, as before with the Inquisition. This was also understood very well by Foucault, who also understood that psychoanalysis should be something different. Psychoanalysis should allow us to listen to the truth, the truth of desire, of the symptom, of the word of the subjects who betray the master's discourse by trying to translate it. By betraying the discourse of the master, we are in what Lacan called the discourse of the historic. This discourse of subversion is at the origin of any revolutionary movement. The revolution begins by expressing and listening to a desire. Then this desire is what allows the revolution to remain open, to describe a spiral movement, to become a permanent revolution instead of returning to its starting point and reconstituting the master's discourse. All this is what Lacan tells us when explaining what he himself describes as the interest of psychoanalysis for the revolution, an interest consisting in allowing the expression and listening to the desire that keeps the revolutionary circle open. What psychoanalysis does is hystericize us and sustain discourse of the hysteric. In this discourse, it is we subjects who speak instead of the master, instead of the ego, by usurping his position as master, just as Lamport tried to usurp the place of the king. Only in this way can we express ourselves as subjects when expressing our desire, expressing ourselves as desiring subjects, but also as divided subjects, traversed by power. The division is flagrant in the case of Lamport. It is as the son of the king of Spain that Lamport wants to free the Mexicans from Spain. His belief in freedom is as solid as his belief in monarchy. His Catholicism is that of a heretic. Lamport is a divided subject because he can only speak of liberty and equality in the discourse of the master, the discourse of the politics of his time, the discourse of the monarchy, of Catholicism and colonialism. It is the same thing that happened with Marx and Engels when referring to the US invasion of Mexico in 1846. Marx and Engels also required the discourse of the master, that of colonialism and imperialism, in order to express their desire that would end up becoming anti-colonialist and anti-imperialist. We can say that Marx and Engels, like Lamport, gave in to their desire in order not to give in to their desire. They betrayed themselves in order not to betray themselves. They made concessions in order not to make concessions. This paradoxical ethics will be conceived by Lacan in his eighth seminar as the paradigmatic modern ethics, in contrast to the ancient ethics of the inflexible Antigone, who does not give up anything on her desire. The new ethical figure is no longer Antigone, but a Claudel character, Signé de Coufontaine, who agrees to marry her family's worst enemy in order to preserve the family patrimony. Signé must give in to her desire in order not to give in to her desire to preserve the family heritage. Don't we have here the realistic ethic, the ethic of real politics, of revolutionaries who must make concessions in order to advance the revolution? Revolutionaries who must betray themselves in order not to betray themselves, who must deviate from the path towards the communist horizon in terrain as mountainous and rugged as reality. I am paraphrasing Lenin because he understood this new ethic very well. He understood it in his revolutionary strategy and made it explicit in his critique of leftist infantilism. I conclude with this paragraph. Lenin understood that Marx's text itself had to be betrayed when translated into real politics. 
he glimpsed that there was oppression on the road to any liberation. For this and for more, Lenin spoke from the division of the subject. He accepted this division and assumed it as a contradiction in his materialist dialectic. It is the same thing that Marx and Engels did. It is for this and for more than that today that we should listen to them and take them seriously in psychoanalysis. This listening is at the base of our manifesto. Thank you very much, David. That was a pleasure to read as something that I hadn't read before and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Ian, uh, for uh, not only your paper, but you did a wonderful job of reading uh, David's paper there. Um, it just shows you how uh, in harmony you are with him and such a, a great collaborator with you. Um, yeah, I know so the style. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, again, uh, so much there to, to um, and I just, uh, I thank David in absentia because he made a lot of sacrifices today, to use that word, uh, to leave his university with poor uh, we um, um, we we um, internet access and he went home to do this and then he had to go back and he, it's a busy time for him in, in academia so we really appreciate what David has, has done and the sacrifice he made to be here. So thank you, I think I'm just conscious of time, I'm not sure if this is going to cut off because it was it was, I, I said it to past nine to half nine, but just wanted to, just in case it does cut off, wanted to thank everyone for their papers and their preparation. Wanted to thank everyone who registered for the event um, and all the comments. Thank you, Anthony, for the support beforehand. And I suppose thank you, Ian and David, for your continued support of psychoanalysis in Ireland and subsequent revolution. Um, so it turns out, I just I, I said the end bit la uh, first, so just in case it does get cut off, but I just wanted to kind of give anyone an opportunity if you wanted to make a comment. Um, if, if, I, if I could briefly, uh, Nigel, um, Ian, I, I can doubly thank you for your intervention and, 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 and David's preoccupation. Um, but I, I was just wondering, you know, the point there about um, Psychoanalysis um, and, and and telepathy, you know, that that that, that, and that the, the differentiating the, the, these activities. Do you think it, at, at some level it's it sort of bound up this the continued fiction of mimesis that that somehow there's the the, the notion that um, any form of representation has got to be completely adequate to that thing that's been been represented, and, and that there's always this kind of mimetic ideal, you know. Which is that 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 the one will become a, a perfect copy of, of 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 the other, which is you know often people's what I would call kind of instrumentalist notions of of translation. You know that that you can you know the good translate will, will capture the whole thing, will like extract the essential uh, meaning. You know which is which is a kind of mimetic fantasy. You know that 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 plays out in in, in, in various ways. Um, so, I mean, do you think that what psychoanalysis is 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 this profoundly anti mimetic um, theory and, and that 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 Fanon's kind of critique of mimicry, for example, in, in in colonial situations was 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 precisely his kind of um, his his profound unease with the way in which particular kinds of uncritical psychology and psychiatry. Uh, were, were beholden to this mimetic ideal um, that you, 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 you created a perfectly adapted subject, which, which would be a kind of a, a carbon copy of, you know, the colonial master or, or whoever. Yeah, I think that's a very good way of putting it. Um, I suppose if I was to translate that into Lacanese, then I would be thinking about the line of the imaginary as one of the lures in psychoanalysis in which the analysand and analyst think that they understand each other and are simply swapping their experiences so that there's a harmonious relationship between the two of them, when in fact the task of psychoanalysis is to arrive at a point of absolute difference. And I think that is difference between the signifiers, knowing something about the nature of language, but also 
difference between speaking subjects. Um, I, 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 I take the point on telepathy from a marvelous book by Hannah Zevin, uh, Z-E-A-V-I-N, called The Distance Cure, where she makes the point that psychoanalysis has always, from the beginning, been mediated mediated in the letters that Freud wrote backwards and forwards to Fleiss, uh, mediated in the, um, the different forms of uh, communication that were set up, and she tracks it forward to the anxiety about use of the telephone and, and now Zoom. Uh, that, that I think what we learn about language as we speak in psychoanalysis is that there, there is no perfect coherence or um, mimicry uh, that is possible and that mimicry always fails. I think the example of Fanon is very interesting as well because he was so good at um, absorbing uh, systems of knowledge and then turning against them, using them against themselves. He was a, a, a master of contradiction and dialectic. Uh, um, actually, in a different, taking a different slant on the Audrey Lord claim that you mustn't, you can't use the tools of the master against to, um, to, uh, uh, to dismantle the master's house. It seems that Fanon shows that this is what you must do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Michael. And I think there's something around, uh, I think Zizek speaks about the, uh, you don't try and go back to the origin of your native language, but if you can speak uh, the oppressor's language even better than they can, you know, you're, that's the, a sign of, of, of control. Um, Anthony, you're, you're going to come in there? Uh, hi, Ian. Thanks for that very interesting paper. And I, I, I read in, in uh, your, your small book that I was reading over today uh, a reference to ego psychology in America. And it's uh, possibly no accident that that came to the fore, in that golden period of capitalism po post war, um, 1950s. And in a sense, has a parallel today with CBT in that its goal is to create functioning. Uh, economic entities uh, and so to, to bring it right back and maybe it's a, 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 a personal question I mean, are you ever aware in your own um, experiences as an analyst that pressure impinging on you in the room with the analysis and or have you been caught out by it and, and just spotted it retrospectively you know, it's a subtle thing. Have you had experience of it? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm often pressed to give diagnosis <laughs> and advice. And it's difficult um, not to do that, you know? Sometimes I must admit where I have felt that someone is putting themselves in danger that I have. And sometimes I've regretted it deeply. Um, maybe a year later, something happens <laughs> in the way they speak, which makes me realize what a disaster that was. And, and sometimes I thought it's the right thing. It's difficult, it's so difficult to know. Um, I, I think what happens in clinical psychoanalysis is that there's a mixture of different modes of relating and we need to know what we're doing and to reflect on that in the supervision um, rather than behave like a robot uh, mechanically kind of re reproducing the ideal of the analyst blank figure uh, you know every time we laugh we're doing something which is transgressing <laughs> pure psychoanalysis, aren't we? 
I, I, I don't know what other others here who who work clinically will will think of that. And maybe it's different. Maybe it's different in Ireland. I have to say that my experience of being in English psychoanalytic training organizations is they're pretty pretty po-faced lock lot and uh, my experience of being in Dublin with the psychoanalysts there is of people who do laugh a lot <laughs> and I know how to have fun the only other place that I've experienced this was in South Korea among South Korean psychoanalysts who told me that they were the Irish of Asia. I often wonder whether that is not to do with these questions we were, we were discussing earlier, you know, about the, the two language spaces. And, and one of the things that happens when you, you begin to move from one language to another is that the, uh, you develop this kind of metalinguistic relationships. So the, 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 when you begin to stand outside language or you come into a language as a language that's not your own you be, so you see it as this sort of this other thing um then you can begin to play with it i mean you know what, what children do is part of the, the process of language acquisition but i think to some extent in a culture where you know in the words of stephen dedalus you're forever fretting in the shadow of another man's language um you so you're in this kind of liminal kind of in between entre deux uh, space where the, the the ludic capacity gets gets greatly increased, you know, and, and hence that that kind of playful kind, of, you know, that 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 you're alluding to, which you know then gets manifested in the, in the likes of of, of of Beckett and Joyce and so on. But I think mm -hmm. in the in the Irish quotidian, the everyday, um, I think that it is there's something in that 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 liminal space that that um, this kind of play area um which is to do with, with the language condition itself you know? yeah yeah uh, you muted nigel sorry sorry you doing sir i was just uh inviting you in okay. um, hello sorry i was delayed there earlier um can you hear me yes Oh, sorry, yeah. It was interesting what you were saying about the South Koreans. My brother actually teaches in, in South Korea and um, he was saying they're actually very similar to Irish experience with the, between, uh, you know, Japan and they're, you know, being colonised and same problems with depression and alcoholism and everything. It's very interesting and famine indeed as well, you know, that um, mm. and uh, have that kind of quirky kind of sense of humour as well, which is... Uh, just thought I'd mention it, you know. <laughs> that I really enjoy. Sorry, I was delayed at the start. It was very interesting because I, I really feel as a workaday psychoanalyst myself for the last almost 30 years, you know, that it's one of the uh, few places that your this freedom of speech is in the consulting room. Now, you know, you know that um it's uh, I think it's to be preserved even more, you know, in today's world. You know, that um, you know, free speech is so important, really. You know that um, and it's uh, getting even more and more difficult to do that you know yeah yeah thanks yeah it's um it's a it's a kind of it's a sacred place the clinic i think we need to guard it we can see we can see at uh, nigel's mouth moving but we can't hear <laughs> i've been i've been muzzled um okay i just wanted to kind of say i think this maybe feels like a good time to to finish we've we've uh, overstayed our welcome in a great way and we've pushed the boundaries of time um because i think i think personally there's something kind of very unique happening uh, and it happened there today so I just wanted to thank all the, the, the speakers and presenters who put a lot of time and effort into their, and I think, yes, we're going to be chewing on this for a while. Um, and I know I'm looking forward to having the, the video recording to go back on it. Um, so listen, thank you everyone. And thank you um, to all the speakers and uh, to Ian and, and David for your, your contributions. Um, and we look forward to your next collaboration, if I can be so bold. <laughs> 
I look so, forward to listening to you again. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so thanks very much, folks. I'm going to end it yes. here. Good night, Good night. Thank you.